Hey, there we go. How's it going, everybody? Hope you're doing well. Got some music going in the background. Let's turn up that microphone a tiny little bit here. There we go. Check, check, check my mic. That's a little better, I think. It's a little quiet. Let me uh, let me just double check my microphone settings here. How's everybody doing? Harbender, good to see you in chat. Always nice to uh, have you hanging out. How's uh, how's job today? How's work? It's, uh, it's been encouraging to hear on your stream that you love your job. So it's great to hear. Great to hear. Um, there we go. There. Now I'm a little louder and I don't have to feel like I'm yelling at everybody. And I can turn this one back down a little bit. There we go. It's going good. Sounds good. Looks good. You are remotivated. That's awesome. It's great to hear. Fantastic. Well, for anybody new hanging out with us, I'm Ian Douglas. I'm the author of this website, techinterview.guide. Um, I did drop a note in the 100 devs chat um, just as Leon was wrapping up that uh, that I was going to start streaming. So we might have a couple of 100 devs folks dropping by. I was unable to connect with the Discord over there. So I don't know if I got banned from their Discord because I advertised free career coaching. I don't know. I wouldn't think you'd get banned for uh, advertising something for free, but whatever. Um, I don't know if that's actually what happened, but I tried joining the Discord. Like, I'm not in the Discord, but I also can't join the Discord. So I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? I might uh, I might try and reach out to Leon, see if I can uh, find out what's up. Uh, if I if I got banned, that's fine. It is what it is. So, but hope everybody's doing good. Um, no super big agenda today. Um, I did get the bot working again, so you can do bang help. And you'll see all the commands. Um, I got the nano leaf things working on channel points, so you can redeem channel points now to control the uh, the lights. And I think that works every five minutes. I think that's how I set it up. So every five minutes, someone else can go change the lights to be something else. Um, and there's also like a really high point one to make it blink, uh, basically to make it do this minus the applause. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully have a little bit of stuff going there, but. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how things go. Um, how dare I offer free coaching advice? I know, right? How dare I? Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Um, yeah, it's funny. I've had people reach out and they're like, is this really free? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, what's your gimmick? I'm like, there's no gimmick. I'm doing it for free. Like, I'm just here to help people out. And they're like, you must want something. I'm like, yeah, I want people to get jobs in tech, specifically diverse people in tech. And they're like, vote. Is it really free? I'm like, yes, it's free. Just come hang out with us. Oh, well. Can't change people's minds on things, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a pretty good week so far. It's been a busy week at work. Uh, wrapping up a workshop uh, that I'm giving on the 11th. It's going to be a big, big workshop. We got, I don't know, 600 or so people registered for it. Um, got quite a few people uh, registered for that. Um, let's see what else is going on. How much else going on? Just work. <laughs> Just work and mock interviews. And oh, I'm going to be streaming on Saturday. So uh, down here underneath my picture. So I'm going to be streaming on Saturday. Um, I follow a guy here on Twitch named Loyal Moses. And he's going to be doing a streamer appreciation kind of thing. And basically, if you're a streamer, so Harbender, this would be a good one for you. Um, he's giving away a Stream Deck XL, the one with the 30, 30 keys on it. And also an Elgato key light, like one of those big panel lights. Each of those things is like 250 bucks and he's giving one of each away for free on his stream to anybody who streams, gets a couple of people hanging out and then you raid into his channel and then uh, you can basically just introduce yourself and be like, this is what my channel is, heard about, heard about all this and your viewers will also get entered into some kind of giveaway as well. You don't have to stay on his stream to like win his giveaway. He's going to like keep track of things and send you a whisper or something if you win. But yeah, he's basically giving away a Stream Deck XL as well as uh, the Elgato Key Light on Saturday, sometime on Saturday. So he's starting at like 10 a.m. Pacific time and he figures he's going to go until the evening. So I'm going to stream a little bit, uh, probably around lunchtime-ish here. Uh, so probably around 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, which would be noon here in, in Mountain Time. Um, so I might stream for a little bit. I might do a little bit of live coding and show some of the chatbot stuff that I've been working on. And then I'm gonna raid into his channel because I'm a, I'm a big fan of his channel. I hang out there quite a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, he's constantly giving stuff away for 3D printing, but he wants to help other streamers out. And he's like, buying this equipment's expensive. And so he just wants to help people out. So he's giving stuff away too. 
Um, and then speaking of giveaways, I'm going to be doing a giveaway every stream in May. Um, I've got a whole gaggle of those 3D printed dragons hanging out over here on the desk behind me. And I've got three more printing right now that'll be done in a couple of hours um, in all different colors, all different like filament colors and combinations and the glow in the darks and, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to be giving at least one, maybe two away every stream in the month of May, but only to people who are subscribed to my daily email series. So uh, you can do bang email in chat. Uh, so bang email, oops, helps if you spell it right, bang email. So go subscribe to the email series because I'm gonna be giving these things away. I'll probably give one away to just somebody on the stream, but I'm also gonna be drawing like one random subscriber um, and I'm gonna contact them and say, hey, you want a, a 3D printed dragon? Let me know where you live and uh, I'm going to get these things mailed out um, towards the end of the month. And if they're on the stream, I'll let you pick what, like which one you want. Uh, I'm going to have two different styles and lots of different colors. And so you're going to get to pick. So um, if you're on the stream, I'm just going to show you a whole bunch and be like, which one do you want? And then if you are subscribed to the email series, you're just going to get a random one. So um, it'll be a surprise, but I will need like mailing info and stuff like that so yeah the dragons are pretty sweet um harbender did i send you a dragon last time on the on the giveaway that i did back in december i don't remember if you were hanging out basically i had 12 to give away we only had 12 people chat that night um and so everybody in chat basically got a, a free 3 3d printed dragon i don't recall if you were one of them um or no you were one of them but yours was like the last one that i sent out or something wasn't it no I forget who it was. It was someone. Oh, I think it was Creature Next. Uh, Creature Next. Um, I just I delayed and got put off, and it was just sitting on the desk. And I'm like, shoot, I got to email that or got to mail that out to them. And uh, and then it turns out that they were like overseas, and so it took like a month and a half to get it. Once I did get around to actually sending the thing, it took him like a month and a half to actually get the thing. He's down in like South America or something. You got the socks in the book. That's right. That's right. You got the uh, the postman uh, set up. Cool. Well, the uh, the chatbot is now a lot more interactive when it comes to channel point redemption. So if you uh, do a redeem for hydrate or um, what was one of the other ones? There's hydrate and what else? Oh, silly rapid fire question. It's going to like randomly pick a, a silly question for us to answer. Um, Riker's not hanging out in his kennel or I would turn on his camera. He's passed out at my feet instead but uh yeah i hope everybody's doing good got a couple more viewers so no no strong agenda i was just going to do some q a if you got questions about interviewing uh my specialty is helping people in the interview process there you go yay you made them blink i didn't have to touch anything i didn't even have to reach over and hit that button to make those things blink which is fantastic oh thank you for reminding me to hydrate um yeah, so my specialty is in tech interview uh, or the tech industry and helping people out with uh, interview prep and career prep, uh, stuff like that. Um, no command called hydrate was found. So yeah, bang hydrate will not work. It'll be a, it'll be a channel point redemption for the hydrate. Um, so yeah, you can do uh, you can do bang help and you'll see a list of the commands there that you can run. Um, I thought that worked, didn't it? Bang help. Yeah, there we go. So these are all the different uh, commands that you can run. And Harbender has a question. I have a question for you. So let me do this. I'm going to do start marker. Um, I have a question for you. What's the shortest time you've been at a company before you left for another job? Three hours <laughs> was the shortest job I had in the tech industry. Um, the next shortest one was about a month. And the one... I guess before or the longest one after that would be the one that I just left before coming to Postman. Um, I went there in early July and I left in early December. So I went uh, all of July, August, September, October, November. So I was there for five months. Aside from that, I've been at most jobs at least a full year. Um, usually I stick around like year and a half, two years. So yeah, long story that. So the three hour job, I basically had a friend get me the job. So he, he and I worked together at an e-commerce company in, uh, in Los Angeles. 
And he basically got me this job with no interview, just his reputation alone. He's like, I got this guy, he knows PHP. And they basically said, well, have him come in, we'll chat. And they didn't ask me any technical questions. I mean, they asked a little bit about PHP. Um, and they're like, you want a job? I'm like, yeah, I want a job. They're like, cool, you're hired. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> And I got a job and I showed up for that job and I had been interviewing at, at only a couple of places and I was really hoping for this job with this gaming company. And the morning that I go to this new job, like I, I get there at like 8, 8.30, something like that. And the first couple of hours, you know, at a job like that, the only thing you're doing for the until lunch is like filling out HR paperwork and like getting your laptop set up and stuff like that. So it's usually like start installing everything and while you're not install or while you are installing something and waiting for some download you're like filling out hr paperwork while i'm filling out all the hr paperwork around 11 o'clock the gaming company calls and they're like hey we want to make you an offer i'm like i've lit i literally just started the job today like where were you <laughs> and they're like well we really want you on the team i'm like i really want that job so i went and talked to my manager i'm like um so this other job that I wanted, I got, uh, I got an offer and I'm going to go take that job now. And the guy's like, what? He's like, you just like, what? And I'm like, well, I don't want this to reflect poorly on my friend. I know he kind of stuck his, his neck out and, and whatever and got me the job. And, and they're like, well, of course it's going to reflect badly on him. He recommended you and you're like walking away after a couple of hours. And I'm like, well, it's not like I really did any work here. I didn't say that, but in my mind, I'm thinking like, it's not like I actually did anything here yet. Um, but yeah, so that was the shortest job I had. Um, other than that, a couple of years later, um, I, I left a job. So you, you've heard me talk a lot about the, the startup in Los Angeles that I was at where I was working like 90 hours a week. When I left that job, I left that job early November of 2009. And then I worked another job for the month of December, basically. I got another job like early December. Um, and it ended up just being, it, it was kind of a bait and switch. I'll be honest. It was a bait and switch. They're like, we're going to hire you, you know, Pearl. Um, we've got this whole website in Pearl and we're going to be converting everything over to Ruby on rails. And we want to hire you. We're going to teach everybody on the team, Ruby on rails. Um, you're going to learn on the job. So you don't have to learn on the side, like all this stuff. And they're going to pay a really good salary. I'm like, all right, I'll take that job to, to go learn something new. Rails was just kind of taking off and I'm like, this is going to be a great opportunity. And I get in there and my first day, they're like, all right, your first job, your first task, your first job ticket, day one, your lap, or actually I didn't even have a laptop. I had a desktop machine and they're like, all right, here's your first task. We want you to go change the phone number on our website. I'm like, okay. So I go in and I download all the, all the website and I'm looking through to figure out where the website is. And I realize the website's actually a phone number or sorry, the looking for the phone number. And the phone number is actually a graphic. It's not even text. It's, it's an image. And so I reached back out to my manager. I'm like, Hey, it's an image. How, like what kind of tooling do you all use? Like, is there an original one that I can go in and just modify and like, you know, do you use like a Photoshop kind of thing where it's already actually stored as text and it's going to convert to an image? Do I have to try to figure out what font this is? Uh, and so I'm asking all these questions They're like, whoa, 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 it's an image that belongs to the graphics department. You're going to have to coordinate with them to go get you the new phone number. And I'm like, well, how long is that going to take? And they're like, oh, it usually takes them a couple of days. And I'm like, so what do I do with the other seven and a half hours of my day? Because that was the only thing that you assigned me to do all day long. And it got worse from there. <laughs> I'm like, you're going to pay me a hundred grand a year to change a phone number on a website. Okay. It's your money. And, uh, it, it, it went downhill from there. So they had me looking at other things and they were, they were basically using a, <laughs> my kid's opening a popsicle and it's really, really loud, crinkly plastic. That's all right. Um, they, they basically were using a, a template system in Perl called Mason. And they're like, we want to go in and we want to convert all this stuff. And I'm like going through, and I'm learning the template and whatever. And then like a week later, they're like, well, we don't really see that you're getting up to speed very quickly. I'm like, I'm getting up to speed just fine. Like you're not giving me very, you know, great things to actually go work on here. Um, and uh, so anyway, I ended up, I, I decided pretty early on I was going to leave that job because it was basically a bait and switch. The whole thing about Ruby on Rails is I got in there and, and after like a week, I'm like, by the way, like, weren't we switching all this stuff to Rails? Like, why do you have me going through and modifying all this like Perl 
Mason template, you know, static site generator kind of stuff. Like, aren't we converting all this over to Rails? And they're like, nah, that's like a year and a half away at least. I'm like, you told me as I was being hired that this was what you were bringing me on the team to do. And they're like, well, yeah, like in a year and a half. And so I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> like, like, why not be honest with somebody about that? Um, and so I decided I was going to leave. But in California at the time, if you quit a job, your benefits run out at the end of that month. And I'm like, well, I'm going to just play this out through the holidays. I'm going to go back the first day in January and quit. And that way I at least get benefits through the end of January. And, uh, and so that's when I started interviewing with my friend to be like, Hey, can I get a job with you working at this other company? And they're like, sure, no problem. They kind of fast tracked everything. And then I was also interviewing with a game company. And, uh, and so about the middle of January, I get the job with the game company and I'm like, all right, cool. Now I can like go take that job. I still had a couple of weeks of overlapping benefits. And so timing wise, it worked out great. Um, so that was my second shortest job. I was there for a month. I started in early December and I left the first day back in January. And I basically, I went in that day and I wiped my computer and I just walked up, I walked away. And the recruiter that got me that job, uh, called me later that morning and they were like, did you leave? Like, did you quit? I'm like, yeah, I'm done. And they're like, well, you should probably like at least email them and tell them. So I emailed them. I'm like, I quit. Like, what do you want me to say? Like, you didn't like me. It clearly wasn't a, the the job that I was, you know, promised to come in at. So like, why am I here? And uh, so, yeah, burned a lot of bridges on that one and uh, stayed in touch with that recruiter for a little while, but uh, not not a real long time. But I mean, it wasn't her fault. So the like, I don't blame the recruiter whatsoever because they basically lied to her to get me into that job. And uh, yeah, it was it was shady all around. There were a lot of things shady about it. The nice thing, though, is because I and so one question that comes up on the on the stream a lot is what do you do if you have a gap on your resume and so my whole thing that I tell people is like I kind of have this blanket you know ianDouglas.com LLC kind of thing and when I have a really short job like that it just kind of rolls under like yeah I did a little bit of consulting work for a month and that's all I tell people is like yeah that two month gap like I was doing a bit of consulting in there and people are like okay and that's it it's just kind of like washes over and they don't ask anything deeper about it and you know once you start getting other jobs then they don't even ask about the gap on the resume anymore so those are my two shortest jobs um <laughs> it's not like you took too much of their time or anything yeah exactly sounds like my old manager what happened with your friend after you left that first three-hour job oh that was that's a good question so um i avoided him for about two years i didn't like interact on social media nothing i i felt so bad i'm like and so i caught up with him like years and years later and it's one of those things where the longer you leave it the more embarrassed you feel about getting in contact with somebody and so i just i i dragged it out a really really long time i want to say it was the better part of seven years i think before i reached out and i'm like by the way, dude, I'm really sorry about that job. He's like, no, no, no. He's he's like, it's fine. I actually only stayed a little bit beyond you. He goes, I realized it wasn't a good place to work either. Um, and he ended up leaving himself. And I'm like, well, I felt really bad that, you know, you made that recommendation and kind of like put your reputation out there, you know, to vouch for me. And they hire me. And then I, I walked out and he's like, nah, it's not a big deal. I'm like, all right. <laughs> So yeah, we, we kind of patched up and then I don't think we've spoken since. I think we've, we've interacted like maybe once or twice since then. So over, gosh, that was the end of 2009. Yeah, that was like December, 2009. I think we've spoken maybe two or three times since then. And we just, we kind of went different ways and he's still, I think he's still around Los Angeles and I'm out here in Colorado now, obviously. So it's not like we pal around or chum around anymore, but yeah, good times, good times. Cool. Well, we got a couple of extra viewers in. So welcome to the stream. I'm Ian Douglas. I'm the author of this website, techinterview.guide. Uh, I'm just here to help people out with career advice and interview prep. And uh, tonight, apparently I'm in story mode, just telling people about really, really short jobs that I've had. Uh, only two of them were really short. Um, this last one that I had last summer, um, it felt shorter. So I was there, technically I was there five months. I started in early July. I left in early December. And of that whole time, I worked three months because I 
I got the job in early July. At the end of July, I needed shoulder surgery, and that basically knocked me out for two months. Like, I couldn't type. I couldn't sit comfortably at a desk. I couldn't, you know, my arm's in a sling, so I could really only type with one hand. And uh, my manager at the time, he's like, dude, it's fine. Like, just take whatever time you need, heal up, get better. It's fine. And I'm like, yeah, but I feel bad. You know, I feel bad that, you know, I'm just sitting here and I'm not contributing. He's like, no, it's fine. Just heal up, get better. Um, but then, yeah, out of sight, out of mind, I think is, is kind of what comes to my mind with, with jobs like that, where when you're offline for an extended period of time, you know, on any kind of leave, any kind of family leave, medical leave, whatever it is, um, out of sight, out of mind is, is basically because you're not there, you're not interacting with things, you kind of get forgotten about. And in that particular case, I got forgotten about. I wasn't included in a lot of meetings and a lot of planning until I'm like, all right, I think I'm going to leave. You know, here's my notice. And then they're like, oh, by the way, we want to invite you to this meeting and this meeting. And we want you to, you know, you know, help us improve all these processes. And I'm like, why? I'm leaving. Like, I just told you I'm leaving. Um, and then suddenly it's like, oh, you know, now it's a big deal. Like, you know, we need to get you involved. So, um, yeah, it just, it was, it was disappointing. It was a company that I'd worked at in the past. And they basically hired me back, like no questions asked, no, like barely in an in interview. It was like a conversation of like, you want to come back? Let's figure out what you're going to do and let's hire you. Um, but then, it, yeah, it just didn't work out, unfortunately. Dragon 89 good to see you in chat. Um, so let's see. So Dragon. Dragon asked a question in chat. What would you say a good salary is for a tier one service desk? Um, what kind of service desk? Give me a little more context about um, what you're thinking of. Is it is it a tech company or is it just a generalized company and you're doing like customer support? Um, give me a little bit more background and, and information on what you're thinking there. Starting salaries vary a lot based on who the company is, where they're located, what the industry is, how big the company is. There are a lot of factors that play into like kind of a starting salary. Um, also, if it's a service desk where you're doing like IT service or customer service, those are going to vary quite a lot. Um, so it really depends on what kind of work you're going to be doing as part of that service desk type of role. But it's also going to be based on your location, if you're doing it remotely, things like that. So I don't know that I'm going to have a very specific answer for you, like, oh, it should be 60000 a year or something like that. Um, it's going to really depend a lot on who the company is and uh, like where they're located, where you're located, um, all those kinds of factors. So if you can give me a little more context in chat, I'd be happy to, to try to answer that for you. Um, entry level jobs, you know, of course, are, are going to start lower than than a lot of other jobs, but depending on the kind of role, they can start a little bit higher. For example, I do know people that are getting into entry level programming jobs where the industry average in the past was like 75K to 80K per year in, in US dollars. And that's pushing closer to like 90 now. But again, it depends on your location. It depends on where you live because some companies will pay you differently based on where you live, uh, which I think is a bit silly, to be honest. I think companies should pay you the same money no matter where you live um, because you're bringing the same value to them no matter where you live. Although some, some companies will use the argument of like, you know, oh, well, you live in this area and it's more expensive to live there, so we're going to pay you more because you live there. Um, and I actually had a, a bit of a tweet storm about this the other day because a recruiter reached out and they're like, hey, are you interested in a teaching job? I'm like, no, I already got a job, but I make this much. Like, can you match it? And they're like, no. And they're like, but tell your friends. And I'm like, well, how about you tell me the salary band that you're willing to pay and then I'll maybe tell my friends. And they're like, well, we base it up based on where they live. And so my counter argument to them was, well, why does it matter where they live? And they basically came back and said, well, you know, we, we, we adjust your salary based on location because it costs more to live in certain areas. And I'm like, okay. So I said on Twitter, I'm like, I hope everybody lies to the company and says that they live in New York or San Francisco. So they get the salary that they deserve because just because you live in a more rural area doesn't mean you provide less value to the company. And that salary really is value. Um, like that's them showing you your value to them. Um, and so I think you, you should get paid the same either way. Um, and RC Maniac says, uh, yes, I believe location should not change the paycheck. Yep. And Harbender says, I remember this. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, I just tweeted about this the other day. Um, so S Dragon got back, said you kind of answered as I was referring to a help desk or a service desk. Okay. If um, So again, though, it, it does depend a little bit. Like if it's a manufacturing company, 
and you're working service desk to go like, you know, fix somebody's computer, you may make a little bit less money than if it's like a tech company where you're going to be doing like internal service desk work or customer service type work. Um, if you're interacting with customers as opposed to internal people, um, sometimes you'll make a little bit more money. Not always, but again, it does depend on the company, the size of the company, the age of the company, um, kind of the financial kind of aspect of it, where they're located, where you're located. So there's going to be a lot of factors in there, to be honest. Um, I would say like, try to network with other people at the company. If you're interested in taking a job there, network with other people and find out from them like what the salary range is or talk to someone in human resources there and say like, I'm interested in the job. Can you tell me what the salary band is? And the band is basically like, what's the highest and what's the lowest that you'll pay for that particular job. And if they're a good company, they'll tell you. If they're like, well, let's get through the interview process and then we'll talk about salary. Just be like, no, I don't want to waste anybody's time. Like, are you, you know, are you offering market rate? You know, what is, what are you offering for the job? When I did my job hunt back in December and January, I interviewed with 30 companies and only one of them would not tell me the salary when I asked. So ask. Like the worst they're going to say is they don't want to tell you or the, they may come back. Like when you say, how much are you offering? They might say, well, how much do you want? Uh, I would say, well, you know, again, I would counter that back to them and say, you know, like I'm, I'm flexible on my salary, but I want to know what you're offering for this particular role, given the responsibilities and the amount of experience that you want. What are you offering for this role? Like what's the high and low of the salary band? And then if that's kind of within what I'm looking at, then we can move forward or, you know, maybe we'll move forward anyway, you know, so I can learn more about the company because it's not all always about the money, but for your first job in tech, it should be about the money. Honestly, um, you should get paid what you're worth and your pay should not be based on previous salaries. It should not be based on location and it certainly should not be based on demographic data of any kind whatsoever. So yeah, um, I would just, I would straight up ask. If, if you've got a question about it, just reach out to them and say, what are you offering? More and more states are actually passing laws now that, um, that they have to specify the salary as part of the job post itself. Um, like Colorado now, we've got that, this law that says that you have to share the salary. And so when I had this conversation with this recruiter the other day, and uh, they were kind of going back and forth with me about, you know, you should tell your friends. I'm like, well, I'm not going to waste their time if you're not offering market rate. And then they stopped talking to me um, after that, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, but one of my last messages to that recruiter was, well, your company has employees in Colorado. And if you want to recruit other people in Colorado, then your job post by law has to include salary information. Like that's Colorado law. You have to follow that law. And that's when they stopped responding to me at that point. It's like, okay, well, if your company is going to be like that, then I'm going to call you out by name on Twitter plural site and uh you can you can deal with it like i'm not going to recommend you know my friends go work for that company if they're going to pay you based on where you live and they're going to adjust your salary based on all of that and they're not going to be open and honest about the salary that they're offering and because they're they're basically hiding how much they want to pay and i think that that's a rotten move for a company so um, Harbender says in chat, I've seen those only for Colorado residents, you know, dollar amount to dollar amount. I've also seen a lot of job posts, unfortunately, that say this is a remote position unless you live in Colorado. Um, because companies want to exclude people that live in Colorado because they don't want to have to, uh, disclose the salary. So it goes both ways. So in some cases they will disclose the salary if you live in Colorado and in other cases they will bias against you because you live in Colorado and they don't want to have to publicize that. So it, it, uh, it cuts both ways and it's unfortunate. And that's again, going back to common advice that I give on the stream, don't put geography on your resume. If they know you're in Colorado, they're going to bias against you. They're like, we don't want to have to tell you this information. <laughs> um, and so it really shouldn't matter where you live. It really shouldn't matter. RC Maniac says, Ick, I'd totally avoid those companies. Yeah, I agree. And I would avoid them too. Cool. We'll uh, definitely keep going with the uh, with the questions here. Don't mind these other, uh, uh, you know, commands that I've got going on. Uh, this uh, admin marker kind of stuff. Um, basically, I wrote some commands into my bot that only I can run. 
um, that basically mark the start and end time of when I'm starting to ask or starting to answer a question and when I finish answering that question. And that's going to build up these time markers for me, hopefully. And then I can then take these into, uh, into my other software and like slice and dice the video. So don't, don't mind the, the extra commands. I'm trying to figure out a way to like send them as whispers to the bot. Speaking of whispering to the bot, um, I do have the anonymous question asker thingy back up and working. Um, and so you will see the ID736 bot, uh, you know, sending the occasional message in chat. You can send a whisper to the bot and anything you whisper to the bot will come through to chat saying, hey, anonymous question. So if you do have a question that you don't want to ask publicly, but you still want to ask a question, you can absolutely do that. Just send a whisper to the bot and it'll show up in chat as an anonymous question. Now, if this starts to get abused, I will turn it off. Um, so keep that in mind. I won't, I won't like to have to turn it off, but I will turn it off. And I can also go back in and actually log in as the bot and I can see who the whisper is from. Um, and, and, you know, if it, if you abuse it too much, you will not be in my channel anymore. Not that I want to like start swinging that ban hammer around, but I just don't want people to abuse it. It's, it's meant to be a safeguard for people that want to ask a question in a way that they feel safe. Um, and so feel free to send a whisper to the bot and just say, Hey, I've got a question that I don't want to ask publicly. Just ask the question. You don't even have to like start phrasing it that way. Just ask the question. You've only got like a couple of hundred bytes. Um, but, uh, yeah. So if you want to ask something anonymously, send a whisper to the bot. That's this username right here, ID 736 bot. Just send that user a whisper. So you can just click on the username, click on whisper, send a message and it'll show up in chat as an anonymous question and nobody will see who it's from. Um, so yeah, so, um, and I think I mentioned last stream too, the next part of my chat bot is to get this connected to the discord server. So you can also do bang discord and you'll get an invite, uh, link to come join our discord channel. Um, if, if you want to hang out there, you're more than welcome to. Um, and ultimately what I want is all of these anonymous questions to end up in a channel that I have specifically on discord for anonymous questions. Um, so again, the bot will be posting them in there on your behalf. And then I usually go through and I emoji them, um, you know, that they got answered on a stream. So ideally what I would love to do is actually have like when I actually answer it on the stream to like find some way of marking like that thing got answered on this particular date so that, you know, whoever sees that in chat knows like, oh, go back and look at this, um, go look at this video at this timestamp and you're going to see, like, you can actually watch your question get answered. That's the kind of automation that I want to build. Um, so for right now, I'm just, I'm kind of timestamp marking, uh, when I start to start and end answering questions so that I can, uh, kind of do the, the smaller video clips and things like that. So good times, good times. I've been having fun uh, working on this bot kind of off hours while I'm like lurking on other people's streams, like Heartbender, uh, you know, all like, listen to him go on and on about politics or astrophysics or you know whatever while playing uh, dead for daylight and i'll just be like working away on my bot on the side uh, so yeah good times good times cool who else is hanging out in chat tonight uh we got heartbender we got rc maniac it's kind of a quiet evening tonight but uh if you do have other questions please feel free to uh to drop them in there um and I'm still doing the, uh, the shout outs, of course, to the VIPs and, and, uh, and so on. Um, juggling biohazards, uh, last stream gifted five gift subs to other people, which I'm enormously grateful for. Um, and they picked tile number 13 up here behind me, which two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. It's going to be this one, I think is, is theirs. If I counted that right, three six nine ten eleven twelve thirteen so yeah this one this tile here now belongs to juggling biohazards and they sent me something that they would like me to 3d print and actually hang on that tile and it's basically going to be a person juggling the biohazard symbol it's going to be kind of small so i don't know if you're going to really be able to see that it's like biohazard symbols it may just look like somebody juggling um, but I'm going to see if I can get something 3D printed to actually hang over that tile. I may hang it on one of these tiles over here where you can see it a little bit better, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. Um, but yeah, so 
again, just for transparency reasons for, for other people that, that uh, just joined in the last couple of minutes, um, any money that I make on the stream from subs, bits, dona donations, um, anything like that, um, I'm not keeping any of that money. I'm giving 100% of that money away. You can do bang money in, uh, in the chat to kind of see what I, what I plan to do with the money. Um, but at a really high level, I'm basically looking to give all that money away to organizations who are promoting diversity in tech. Um, and so if you want to help out with that effort, you're more than welcome to, if you subscribe, if you gift subs, um, I will sort of let you like own one of these tiles and I will like 3d print a little like logo or whatever's important to you. And I will hang that over top of the little tile here for you. Um, I've got a bunch of 3d printers here and so i'm i'm working on little designs of like little hangers that'll be transparent so you won't see the little hanger arms hopefully um and then it'll like be a logo of whatever you want you want the spider-man logo you want you know the twitter logo like whatever's important to you i'm gonna hang on here as long as it's something that's you know community friendly um and and i do like to be kind of family friendly as far as like language and things like that go um, but if you have a logo of something that you would like displayed over your panel, um, I will do that. The other thing that I'm trying to do, I need to get in touch with uh, the NanoLeaf people and talk to them about their API. I would love to have this animated kind of effect going on the NanoLeaf, but then like if Heartbender owned this tile, whenever Heartbender comes in and like chats, it'll turn that, you know, whatever color their username is. So whatever that shade of pink is that, you know, every time Heartbender sends a message, It'll make that panel blink pink or you know whatever color your your uh, your uh, name is in in the Twitch chat, um, or let you set your own custom color. That's what I would love to get to at some point. It's going to be a little ways off because I got to talk to the Nano Leaf people about their API and see what's possible. Um, I don't know that that's going to be a realistic kind of thing without having to go in and like very intricately write a lot of software to like manage the panels. But uh, that would be what I would love to do at some point. <clears throat> and uh, if, you, if you're here in chat, it'll light up with your color. If you're not in chat, it'll kind of go back and animate with everybody else. Um, so that's where I'd like to get to, you know, just to be a little more interactive. But in the meantime, um, if you do want to help out with the financial goal of diversity in tech, um, I'm, I'm all about that. So any kind of donations, subscriptions, um, you know, bits, all of that money is getting pooled and it's going to be given away. Um, I did have somebody send me a direct message on LinkedIn. They're like, by the way, here's an organization that I really like. And so I'm starting to look into them. Um, and I appreciate anybody that can give me suggestions on who I can give this money to. That is a charitable organization where I can see transparency about how they use their money. Um, I'm happy to consider them as one of the recipients of this money. Um, you're currently writing wrapper APIs as well. Sweet for 3d printing sites. Awesome. Um, yeah, we should chat sometime. I'd love to uh, nerd out a little bit. I'm, I'm always a big fan of uh, working on APIs, consuming APIs, writing APIs, all that good stuff. Um, RC Manic says it's the end of the month. So I'm going through all the Patreon stuff, trying to figure out Mark three. Oh, trying to plan out your Mark three to Mark three S plus. Very cool. I, I kind of stopped at the Mark three S upgrade. Um, well, one of them I bought was already a Mark III S. One of them I upgraded to Mark III S. The other I started upgrading for the MMU, and then I decided I was going to do the bare upgrade instead. And so it's got the like the full aluminum extrusion uh, kind of setup. Um, and then I decided not to do the MMU after all. So my MMU is like in bits and pieces in several boxes, and I should probably go back and figure that out at some point. Um, and then I bought a couple of the mosaic pallet uh, units. So I have a pallet two and I have a pallet three. And neither of them are working. So I'm not doing any multicolor prints right now. Um, but when I do get back into multicolor prints, I can do fun little stuff like this guy. So this was, it was not a fantastic print, but uh, but it came out really, really clean. It, his little antenna broke off the top. It's Omnom from the old video game Cut the Rope. And uh, it's one of my favorite multicolor prints that I actually made. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting the multi-material prints uh, going again at some point over the summer. So... Um, and RC Manic, I forget if it was you that sent me the notes on the palette. You have to remind me if that was you. Um, but someone in chat sent me a whole bunch of notes on getting the palette up and running. And I forget who it was. I still have the email. I've got it bookmarked. I just haven't had a chance to like go through and like look at it and get it, get everything up and working again. But, um, so yeah, so on Saturday, so just thinking about 3D printing, jogged my memory about Loyal Moses. Um, and so there's a channel. Let me give them a shout out here. Um, 
Twitch.tv loyal loyal ghosts. Um, so loyal totally spelled it wrong try this again twitch.tv loyal moses there we go second link not the first one um so loyal moses uh he's been basically building up a really large 3d printing community um but in his generosity he's actually doing a streamer appreciation stream on saturday where if you are a streamer you can raid into his channel on saturday and if you want, you can actually get on a, a little phone call thing where you can actually introduce yourself to everybody else that's watching um, and, you know, pitch who you are, what you stream about and whatever, and try to get more followers. Um, but then by raiding into his channel, you're entered into a giveaway to get um, the Elgato Stream Deck XL, the 30 key version of it, or an Elgato key light, one of those big panel LED lights that like light up your face. Um, I've got two little ones here. I've got the Logitech uh, Lytra or whatever I think they call them. or Yeah, Lytras um, or Lytra Glow or whatever it is. Um, smaller panels, a little bit cheaper, um, but they also get plenty bright too. Like they'll completely wash up my, my face if I make them too bright. Um, and so they work just fine uh, for what I need. But he's giving away these two things during his stream on Saturday. And you don't have to stay on the stream in order to win. Um, you can, uh, you can just raid in and he'll put your name in the drawing. And if you win, he'll send you a whisper on Twitch and you can claim that. So, um, if you are a streamer and you're interested, go check out Loyal Moses. Um, you can, you can totally join that on Saturday. I think he's starting it at, I think he said 11 AM or 10 AM, 10 AM or 11 AM mountain time. Um, and then I think he said 10 AM mountain time. And then, uh, so I'm going to start streaming probably around noon uh, mountain time myself. So around 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, and I'll probably stream for like an hour, hour and a half just to build up some viewers. And then we'll stream over to his channel. Um, not that I need the equipment, but just to help other people like learn about other channels and other stuff that's out there. So there will be a handful of people that are sort of like in the maker community who are like building things, making things with their hands, like little, you know, model kits and Lego kits and 3D printing and stuff like that. Um, but he is open to anybody. You do any kind of streaming, you can go join in and get in on the fun on that. So, um, so yeah, so if you want to, if you want to, uh, please come hang out on Saturday. I'd appreciate uh, having a, a handful of viewers that we can raid over to his channel and, uh, and do that. Mr. Manix says in chat, I upgraded my Mark III to a Mark III S. Later, got the Mark III S to a Mark III S Plus. Never got around to the Plus upgrade. Okay. You got the P3. Need to attach the extruder. Found out the adapters for the Mark III S Plus. <laughs> decided I should just upgrade. Found nearly all the printed parts got replaced. I decided to replace all the orange which me with neon green. Nice. That's great. Chris did a weird thing. Said, hey, this upgrade is an option. And then doesn't say anything about it. Comments asked for it and Prusha responded, it's complex, not worth it. <laughs> Everyone's like, but you mentioned it. Yeah, good times. Uh, Katsil, or Katsil, not sure how to pronounce your username. If you want to help me out there and uh, let me know how to pronounce your username. Uh, Castiel, maybe? I uh, appreciate the follow. Thanks. First time chat. Hello, hello. So I like to give blinky lights to my new followers and this small pause. So. Welcome to the stream. Thanks for hanging out. I'm Ian Douglas. I'm the author of this website, Tech Interview Guide. Um, I'm just here to help people out with career prep and interview prep. We've been chatting a little bit about, um, you know, job histories and what do you do with short jobs and how do you talk about that on resumes. Um, Castile from Supernatural. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, we have some family friends who have the last name of Castile. Um, not related to Supernatural in any way. That just happens to be their last name. So... Um, but yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for dropping by. I'm always curious how people find the channel and, and kind of what you're up to. Uh, I'm just here helping people out with free career prep and interview prep advice. I've been in the industry a long time, in the tech industry specifically, but a lot of the advice that I give on the stream is pretty handy no matter what kind of role that you're in or what kind of role you're interested in getting. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, what I explain about how to build a resume, whether you need a cover letter, how to do company research. That's all applicable no matter what kind of role you do. You don't have to be in tech to come hang out here. Um, and we've got a really vibrant community. We've got a handful of folks hanging out in chat right now. We got uh, RC Maniac who's been in the industry a little while. We got Heartbender who just changed jobs in a new tech job. Um, haven't seen Zooey tonight, but Zooey uh, likes to hang out. 
uh, GND 404 likes to hang out and lots of folks love to help each other out with advice around how to get ready for interviews, how to prepare, uh, what kinds of things to study. We talk about salaries, we talk about negotiations, we talk the whole gamut from how do you prepare to how do you negotiate and everything in between. Um, so you're welcome to drop questions at any time. If you do want to ask an anonymous question, you can do exclamation point anon, or you can do exclamation point help and see all the, all the chatbot commands. Um, but I have an anonymous question thing where you can send a whisper to the bot basically, and it'll show up in chat as an anonymous question. So if you don't want to attach your name to it and, and that makes you feel more safe so that you can ask your question, please do so. I'm here to help and I want to make it as easy as possible. So, um, just Jude, good to see you in chat as well. Um, trying to plan out the optional system with Prusa's help since they otherwise refused. Yeah. Interesting. I haven't, uh, I didn't, I didn't bother with the uh, Mark 3S Plus upgrade on the 3D printers. Um, the last one that I got was mid 2020, and that was a it was a pre-assembled uh, Mark 3S, and I haven't gotten anything since. I've got the XL on order, so maybe get it by Christmas. Maybe I ordered it the day they announced it, like within a couple of hours of them announcing it. I happened to be up really early that morning, and I saw the announcement, and I got a, a pre-order in. Um, but I haven't heard anything since. And they say it's going to be Q3. I'm going to guess it's going to be like late Q3, early Q4. So I doubt I'm going to get it before the fall. But we'll see. If I happen to get it before fall, it would be fantastic. But I'm not counting on it with chip shortages and manufacturing shortages and stuff around the world and stuff going on in Europe right now. I'm, I'm not hopeful that it's going to be Q3. Um, I'm aiming for it late Q4. To be optimistic if they surprise me otherwise i'll be i'll be happy with them so yeah we'll see um the xl will be really neat um i've i've always had an interest in like printing cosplay pieces not that i do cosplay at all but uh i do have a lot of people that are interested in cosplay and uh i'm sure if i were able to print the larger pieces i would have lots of people uh offering me not copious amounts of money but at least cover the cost of materials and, and the print time and so on to uh, to help them out with some printed pieces. So we'll see. Uh, Just Jude says, I want a duplex printer, but whatever's on the market is just horrible. Um, so what do you mean by duplex printer? Like, do you mean like one with, with two nozzles that print at the same time or just, you know, that it can swap out to one or the other or just have like a multicolor kind of option? Or are you talking like, a, a physical printer like a, like a laser printer that prints on both sides of the page because uh, duplex could mean either thing depending on uh, kind of your background and what you know you want to geek out on the xl's potential technical design yeah for sure anyway i got a bunch of channel point redemptions that you can redeem a uh, whole bunch of other uh commands that you can do there's like a bang hello and a bang joke if you want like silly things there's a channel point redemption for um, asking silly questions like, is a hot dog a sandwich? Um, there's all kinds of just fun interactive stuff. There's also channel point redemptions if you want to change the nano leaf. I keep, I used to have to point over this way because I used to stand over here. I'd be like, you know, point at the lights, but now I'm standing over here. I got to get used to using this arm instead. Um, so yeah, there are channel point redemptions for uh, changing up the lights. Um, I think you can just do like a blink. Well, the blink one's a little expensive. Um, as far as channel points go, but for fewer channel points, every five minutes, someone can go in and change the panel to something else. Um, and so you can do bang nano leaf and you can see a whole bunch of information about the nano leaf. Um, so basically, um, it basically just gives you information. Like there are 43 of them on the wall. The current effect is ultraviolet chill and you can redeem, I think 500 channel points if you want to change it to something else. Um, and I think I fixed the color or the uh, case sensitivity. So I think that you can redeem your channel points for a case insensitive thing. So if you type in Boba Fett, a lowercase, it should still work, I hope. I hope I fixed that bug anyway. But uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see whether that actually got fixed. Um, just Jude says, I just wanted to do, wanted to do things on its own. Sneak a page in, spit it out two-sided. Oh, it seems to be a real heavy task for printers. Yeah, so I've got um, I got a brother printer uh, down here beside me. It's the 2550, and it'll actually do both sides. And I want to say it was relatively inexpensive. 
Um, but I also bought like the multi thing where it's a scanner and a fax machine. Not that I fax. I don't even have a phone line in the house. Um, but uh, it's like a multi, multi-purpose multi thing. I bought it mostly for the scanner um, and, and secondarily as a printer because I scan a lot of like bills and stuff that come in and, you know, store, store all that stuff in cloud storage uh, for like tax purposes and so on. Um, but uh, it'll do both sides. So it's the Brother 2550DW or something like that. Um, it works decently well. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Sounds like 500 US inexpensive thing at least. Yeah, I don't know. I forget what I paid for it, to be honest. I think I bought it on like a Black Friday deal or something. I want to say it was like two or $300, but I honestly don't remember. Um, yeah, good times. RC Maniac, just following up on some of your chat. Um, you said they're struggling to get chips. No one supplier told them 72 weeks, wow. Asked the company, they said, oh, it's more than 72 weeks. Wow. The inventory purchase system was hard coded to 72 weeks because nobody expected it to be longer than that. That's wild. Yeah, the supply chain thing around the world is, is pretty ridiculous. I've seen like Raspberry Pis that used to cost like 30, 40 bucks selling for like 100 plus dollars now. I'm glad I've got like an abundance of Raspberry Pis and webcams and all that kind of stuff. Um, I kind of stocked up on all of that stuff right before the pandemic hit. And so I had all kinds of extra cameras and stuff and Raspberry Pis and all that stuff. So I haven't needed to buy any of that kind of stuff in a long, long time. Um, let's see what else is going on. Just having a look through some chatbot output. Looks like I got a bug in my chatbot. I don't think it's affecting anything, but if anybody's trying to change the nano leaf, it's not working. But we'll see. Let me see if I can change the nano leaf to something. No, that worked. So anyway, it just started a five minute cooldown. So if anybody else wants to try it, you gotta wait five minutes, but um Glad I purchased a bunch of Raspberry Pis. Yeah. Cool. So what else is going on with everybody? We've got a handful of viewers. We had even more people show up. So love having people drop by. I'm always curious how people find the channel. Um, so if you're in chat, feel free to drop a hello. Let me know where you're from. Um, my name is Ian Douglas. I'm the author of this website, Tech Interview Guide. Um, I'm just here to help people out with career prep, interview prep. If you've got questions about interviewing company research, like how do you research a company? How do you build a resume? I've got a lot of thoughts on the matter. I've been in the tech industry for 26 years. Uh, today, actually, today is my 26th anniversary of graduating college. And uh, I've been in the tech industry ever since. I've been a hiring manager. I've been a director of engineering. I've had a lot of roles uh, kind of across the, the spread of, of everything in the tech industry from DevOps to DBA to programmer to everything, like running network cables and setting up data centers, uh, the, whole, the whole gamut. Um, worked at a lot of startups, worked at a lot of mid-sized companies, um, and kind of everything in between. Never worked at any FANG company, but I have coached people to get jobs with FANG companies. So if you're interested in like Google, Amazon, Facebook, all those, um, feel free to ask questions about any of that. Um, but yeah, if you've got questions, just anything on your mind, uh, career-wise, interview-wise, you're welcome to, uh, to drop that in chat. Um, again, you can send a whisper to the bot. So just click on the bot's name, go to whisper, send over a whisper. Um, let's just make sure that that works. I'm wondering if that's the thing that's broken. Nope, that worked. Well, it works for me. Works on my machine. <laughs> Hopefully it works for everybody else. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you want to ask a question, but you don't want your name attached to it, feel free to, uh, whisper that over to the bot anonymously. Um, otherwise, yeah, we're just here hanging out and just answering questions for folks. So if you've got questions, uh, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we've been going for about an hour. Um, yeah, what else is going on? Have I encountered... Oh, so RC Maniac is asking, have I encountered any jobs that requested actual API design? I only had one during my first job search, like write a UML diagram and more. Um... 
since then it's just I want two functions one does x one does y it does it does vary quite a lot um, RC for president thanks for the follow appreciate that thanks for uh, thanks for dropping by um, and if you are lurking and you're not following feel free to, to send us a follow we're trying to build up our community here to uh, help people out with career prep and so on um, so jobs that actually require API design, yeah, they're out there. I mean, they're going to be primarily back-end kind of systems or architect type of, uh, of roles, um, but not always. Sometimes it's just a senior dev kind of, uh, kind of role. So it really does depend a little bit on the company, but there are, there are roles out there specifically for API developers, and they want to know that you know how to build a good API, whether it's a RESTful API, gRPC API, using GraphQL, like... There are a lot of different ways of building APIs and a lot of different tooling. Um, and so some of them are going to be technology specific. Like we want people that know Python, excuse me, that know Python and fast API. Um, other companies are like, we just, we need to build some APIs or microservices. The, the question to ask in those interviews is like, why do you want microservices? Like, do you know that you need microservices or is this just a buzzword that you want to build? Um, kind of like companies that want to hire developer relations roles is like, do you really need DevRel or do you just think you need DevRel because you see other people hiring for that? Some people will get caught up in microservice architecture that don't need microservices, but they do need some kind of ser service oriented architecture or SOA. Um, so there are going to be companies out there that are looking for API designers. Although in my experience, the, it's not so much on the design side of like, how do you design a good API? It tends to be more, can you build a good API? Do you know enough about system design principles and, and best practices in the industry for caching and resiliency and, and things like that and scalability and dealing more with that technical aspect than the actual design of it in the first place? Um, that said, being able to design a good API is also a really important skill set to have and something that's honestly lacking quite a bit in the industry as i spend more time working at postman and i look at other people's apis it's like uh, it would be nice if we had like a better sort of uh well we call it governance basically is is it would be nice to have people who focus more on the governance of the api and that's basically what's the look and feel what's the interaction patterns um, and is that standardized across all of their apis um, and, and that's something that a lot of companies haven't spent a lot of time on they They tend to just, like you say in, in chat, it tends to be a lot of, you know, we need, we need you to build an API. So go build an API. Um, and I'm just going to set these markers and then like roll back a couple of minutes. Um, go build an API and we need it to do X, Y, and Z, but they don't really tell you what kind of design to follow. They don't tell you what that interface or interaction pattern is, is meant to be. Um, and so they kind of want you to come in and bring best practices with you. But if you don't know that yourself, then you're just going to go in and you're just going to build an endpoint however you think it needs to be built. And that's why so many companies' APIs feel like they got developed by 50 different people because they did. They got built by 50 different people 50 different ways. And now every API has its own sort of flavor. We're having kind of what we call a governance team is basically someone that can come in and say, okay, all the APIs, the authentication is going to happen this way. The routing is going to look like this. When you pass parameters, it's going to look like that. This is the structure that everything's going to follow. Any kind of message that you get back from the API is going to follow this standard and just have people come in and set that as a design and enforce it. There's one thing to set the design or say, this is how we want to do it. It's another thing to actually make your API do it. Um, but that's, that all comes back to what we call developer experience and really on the notion of how well are people going to like using your APIs? Well, guess what? If your API is internal and your API is, um, if your API is, is basically building out, um, sorry, totally lost my train of thought. If you're building out an API and you have people working within your company and they have to consume that API. If that API is poorly designed, they're going to hate interacting with that API. Um, and, and so they're not going to work with that API. And so even your internal developers deserve some amount of developer experience, not just external facing like customer facing or public facing APIs. That one's certainly going to get you more attention because people are going to be you know, posting on social media and they'll be like giving you grief in, in public spaces about, you know, your API. But your internal developers are also going to be feeling the same pain 
So you really need to do standardize on, on a lot of that. So to kind of go back to your question of do jobs look for API designers, I haven't specifically seen it as a role in a long time, but I think it's something that more companies do need to spend time and, and focus more effort on the actual design of their API and then hold that standard to the company and say, we need to go through and change all of our APIs to follow the same standard. So all of our APIs, no matter what kind of API you're interacting with within the company, they're, they all look the same, they all feel the same, they're all gonna act the same, they're gonna respond the same. And so from an end user point of view, you have a more uniform kind of experience. Now, that company's APIs are gonna be completely different from some other company's APIs, and that's fine, but at least I know when I'm working with your company, all of your APIs are gonna look and feel like this. Um, and so there, there need to be more jobs like that. I haven't seen many myself. Like I said, that tends to be more of a senior or like an architect level role where you're actually gonna be designing that. And then hopefully you also have the authority to enforce it and hold people to that standard, make sure that they're following through on that. Had another question in chat from HFW Levels. Can you discuss the compensation of non-coding tech roles like developer relations? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I currently work in developer relations myself and there's a, there's a there's a bit of a thing in our in our realm in DevRel where some people are like, should we get paid the same as engineers? Should we get paid more than engineers? Some companies think that you do less than the engineers, but I think a developer relations role can encompass a lot of other roles. Um, I've seen DevRel roles pay more than engineers. I've seen DevRel roles that pay significantly less than engineer roles. Um, and so it really depends on what the company feels about developer relations and um, sort of what they think the responsibility should be. They're going to put a value to that in compensation. I think that, you know, our, obviously larger companies, especially fan companies, those salaries are kind of outliers, you know, on, on the upper range. But I think that a lot of mid-sized to small-sized companies, I think, are starting to kind of normalize on that salary band. Um, and so typically what I've seen from like an entry-level kind of DevRel role is still going to be in that 90 to 110, uh, like 90,000 to 110,000 US dollars in my experience and in, in the kinds of jobs that I've been looking at. Um, kind of the mid range is going to be like 110 to 130, 140, and then senior range is going to be like 150 plus. Um, and a lot of that is going to depend on what you bring to the team. When I interviewed for developer relations roles back in December and January, I actually kept track of, of all of the salary bands. And they were all generally like 150 to 180, 190, somewhere in there. Um, a couple of companies that I interviewed with were higher than that. Some of them came in much lower than that. Whenever I got a job offer that was lower than that, I said, hey, like that's not market rate. Compared to what I'm seeing, these are the other offers that I've gotten. These are the other salary bands and who the companies are and what they're offering. Can you at least match those? And I did have one company come back and say, okay, we can match the bottom of that, but we can't go any higher. Like we, we literally can't go any higher on that. And they also weren't gonna offer any extra equity to kind of offset the fact that I wasn't gonna be making salary. Um, and so I walked away from that job offer. I think it would have been a fun job in retrospect. Um, I've been kind of watching what the company's been doing. They've been doing some really neat stuff. Um, but then on the high end, some of the offers that I got were like, you know, offering really enormous salaries, like close to 200 K and my job at Postman, they came in with an offer that was kind of mid range. And I'm like, okay, well, I've got this other offer. That's a little bit higher than yours. Um, you know, and they're like, well, you know, we'll get back to you kind of thing. And then once I started narrowing down my offers, I'm like, okay, I've narrowed it down to three companies. You're one of the top three and yours is the lowest of these three. Like, what can we do here? And they're like, we really can't move on salary. Like we already brought you in at the very top of the band for senior level. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, well, what else can we do? And they're like, you know, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking like signing bonus or extra equity or other perks and things like that. And they came back and they're like, we can give you 40% more equity. I'm like, Heck yeah. So I took that job. Um, total compensation wise, I'm not making as much salaries as those other jobs that I walked away from, but the equity is going to pay a lot more in the long run. So it's, 
it's it really does come down to a personal decision on that there are a lot of different kinds of roles in devrel though and and your responsibilities are going to differ a lot based on level as well as what the company needs you to do as part of your developer relations or, or developer advocacy role and uh, i won't go into this in, in a huge amount of detail because i've covered it a lot on the stream over the past uh, two three months but when we talk about DevRel, we're talking about code, community, and, and uh, content. And how are you building those three things? And I would say the more senior you are, the more they're going to expect that you can do all three. The more junior you are, the more they're going to be okay if you can do like one of the three. And if you're kind of coming in that intermediate, you should have two of those three. So it kind of depends a little bit on what their expectation is around what kind of content are you going to build? How are you building that content? How are you getting it out there? How are you building community? How are you kind of responding to community and kind of building up community and so on? Um, and then of course, like with the coding side of it or whatever the technical aspect of the job is, um, what's your experience level with that? So it'll, it'll vary a lot from company to company, but, from my experience, even varying from company to company, for a senior band, I was still seeing salaries between 150 and 200K. Um, for the intermediate band, even though I wasn't applying for those jobs, I was still seeing them around like 110 to 140 kind of band. And then junior jobs, I was actually seeing like 90 to 110. Um, so you can get a junior job in DevRel or like an entry level role in DevRel. Um, it's a little more rare though. And it tends to be for very established companies who are willing to take on someone who's really good at one of those three things, like really outstanding, like really stands out to them. Like you are amazing at live streaming or you're really amazing at public speaking. We're going to bring you on the team and we're going to train you up in the things that you don't know um, or, or give you lots of practice and coaching around the other things so that you can kind of build up in your career. But it is going to depend a lot from company to company. If you have more specific questions than that, I'm happy to uh, dive in on, on that a little bit more for you. Um, just going to kind of roll back through chat here and see. So Epic Cat also asked a question that I'll get to. Um, RC Maniac says, if you want to determine if non-dev roles can make more than devs, I point at bankers and stock traders. Yeah, but when you're talking about like tech companies, um, you know, you could argue that salespeople are going to make more than engineers because they get commissions and stuff like that. So it, it, it does depend on the company, you know, and, and how you're balancing those things out. But um, RC Maniac also says my job is possi possibly is below market salary. I'm not a senior, but the challenge was that the companies I was seeing were so so in what they did and the companies I got offers from were just not exciting. I went with the one that I wanted after asking for more in nearly every area. It's since provided more equity and more. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you have to advocate for yourself. You have to ask for it. They're not just going to be like, hey, here's this offer. Oh, JK, just kidding. Here's an extra like 10K, 20K. You have to ask for it and you have to explain why you bring that value. Um, cool. So HFW kind of followed up in chat. Thanks for the answer. What do you think? What do you think the role requires for publicity? Uh, for example, can you sign off as XYZ company DevRel or are you expected to have your identity public on forums and social media? Um, so that could go both ways. I've seen some companies where they're like, you know, if you come do developer relations for us, everything you tweet, everything you post publicly has to be like company related somehow. Um, and I think a lot of DevRel people really pushed back on that. And they're like, no, like my personal brand is developer advocacy. I am a developer advocate, no matter which company I go work for. And so I will happily tweet on your behalf, but that's not the only thing that I do with my social media accounts. And I think a lot of companies are willing to be flexible about that. I don't think that you need to really like be a super public, you know, sort of figure in um, like, what am I thinking? Like, like not like a celebrity kind of status, like people might know your name and you know, you're always going to get like the occasional person that like tries to figure out where you actually live and, and, you know, you get creeps and, and stuff like that. But, um, I would, I would hope that those are a lot more rare than we would think. Um, but I don't think that it needs to get quite to that celebrity status. I mean, there certainly are, like, I, I can think of a handful of people in DevRel, um, like right off the top of my head, I'm thinking like Kelsey Hightower, Chloe, uh, Chloe Condon, um, I'm, I'm thinking of all their Twitter handles, uh, Cassidy Williams, 
uh, Emily Freeman. Like there are a lot of really well-known developer relations, developer advocates kind of people. Um, Adam Duvander, uh, Eddie Zaneski, and and Jessica West, like folks that I worked with at SendGrid, like they're all pretty well known in the DevRel space. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're like, you know, just because they're really well known doesn't mean they have to like be super public as far as like what they, uh, um, like what they have to say about themselves. And again, every company is going to have a slightly different expectation about how you handle your personal brand and how that coincides with the company. Now, clearly, if I were to go on Twitter and like run a rampage on something, I would pay repercussions both personally and professionally from that. Um, and, and we've seen that happen to, to people in the past as well. Um, cool. Let's, uh, so let's go back up. Uh, Epicat asked a question that I want to, uh, that I want to address here too. So Epicat asked in chat, uh, what kind of job would you recommend for a front end developer that likes working on different projects instead of the same project over time? I would recommend some sort of consultancy job. There are a lot of consultancy firms out there where they will hire you as a front end dev, but then they'll rotate you onto different projects every three, four, five months, maybe at most six months. Um, I do know one company, they set a hard limit at four months. You never work on a project longer than four months. Your first month, you're overlapped with somebody who's rolling off the project and then you take over. And then your last month, you're bringing someone else up to speed because you're rolling off the project yourself. And so there's this constant rotation of people working on the project. It keeps everybody's skills sharp. It keeps everybody's communication skills sharp because you're constantly sharing that knowledge. And so you're constantly learning from one another, which I think is a fantastic idea, uh, regardless of where you work. I think it's, it's a great kind of uh, motivator for your team to be able to share that knowledge like that. Um, and so I would look for consultancy type roles, um, with, with companies who you like, basically my company would hire them as what we call staff augmentation or something like that, where it's like, my team's not going to finish this project in time. I need three or four devs to come help. And basically you're going to join our team and you're going to like work on that project for a period of time. Um, or it might be, I don't have developers at my company and I need developers to build a chatbot or a website or something will you build that for me? And you'll spend three or four months building it. And then when it's done, you rotate and you do something else. The important thing to ask in those interviews though, is how do you get your clients? How much of a queue do you have? Like when this project is done, do you have another one that I do right away? And if not, what do I do in the meantime? Like, do I get laid off until you get another project? Am I only here for a certain period of time to, to make an impact? Or how are you going to keep me busy if there's not like an active project for me to rotate onto, like what's that going to look like? Most companies are going to say, well, the more people we hire, the more we like try to drum up business or as we drum up more business, we need to hire more people. Or there's like a, there's also turnover in those kinds of roles. People get tired of constantly changing. Um, some people like having more consistent, uh, types of projects. Some people really thrive on like having something new all the time. I'm kind of in between, like I, I kind of go back and forth between like, ooh, shiny, like let's go work on this for a little while. And other times I'm like, oh, I'm like constantly pulled in all these different directions, working on different things. I'd like to just work on one thing for a little while. And I think even consultancy companies can, can help you in that area as well. Sometimes they'll have their own like internal software and their own internal projects to work on. So if you don't want that constant rotation and constant churn, there's like internal software that you could be working on. Um, so that would be the kind of role that I would try to look for and see if you can, uh, find those companies in your area. Um, if they need you to work at a client site, the downside to those jobs, if you're early in your career, the downside to those kinds of jobs is that when you're in those consultancy roles, you're looked at as an expert, you're, they're paying many more times per hour than, than what your company is paying you. So they might pay you 50 bucks an hour but they're going to charge that other company like 150, 200 bucks an hour for your time. And so the company is going to look at you going, how are you earning my $200 an hour? Like they're going to come up to you with questions and they're going to expect answers right away. You may not always have those answers. Um, hopefully you're not working alone on a project where you can get cornered like that, but that is something to be aware of, especially if you're early in your career and you do get one of those jobs when you're more senior and more seasoned, it's usually not a big deal, but there's always the chance that if I, like even as a senior dev, if I get put on a project and there's a bit of tech that I'm not familiar with, I need to go learn that too. Um, but 
at the end of the day, it kind of it kind of all evens out. Um, but those would those would be questions that I would be asking, like how how are you filling up that queue? How are you supporting newer people on the team? Um, you know that sort of thing. That would be the kind of job that I would want if if you want more of a change. Um, and then again, you can work that job for a year and a half, two years, build up a lot of experience, and you grow in a massive way in those kinds of roles because you're constantly working on new projects, you're constantly picking up new technologies. One downside that I have seen in that kind of role is you don't go particularly deep on any one technology. You're working on that project for four months using that one framework, and then the next project you're maybe still writing in the same language, but you're working in a completely different framework. And so the amount of transferable knowledge that you have from one project to another may vary a lot. And so it may feel like, oh, I'm learning a ton, but I'm not learning it really well. I know it well enough to implement within this company, within this particular project and time frame. But once I rotate off, I'm not using that technology anymore. So do I even put that on the resume? It's like, well, you can if you're going to keep that skill sharp. Um, but that's also a downside to that kind of job. So keep those things in mind. Um, I have worked in, in that kind of role in the past, and it's fun. For me, it was fun for a while. Um, and then when I did my freelance work, um, that's basically what I did as a freelance consultant, is I got to pick and choose my clients. And I worked with them for as long as I wanted to. And then when I didn't want to work for them anymore, I'm like, hey, I'm going to like wrap up my end of things and I'm, I'm going to move on to this other project. And they didn't really have a say one way or the other because I would always write up my contracts and say, I can leave at any time. I'm not staying to like a finish point. I'm just here to be augmentation for a period of time. And, you know, either of us can give two weeks notice to cancel the contract kind of thing. And so if, you, if you're if you going to do it as a freelance, make sure you have that kind of thing written into your contract. But there are companies out there who will pay your benefits and pay your taxes and all that kind of stuff as a consultancy type of role. So I would aim for that uh, that kind of position. Just gonna uh, scroll back through chat here a little bit. Uh, there were some other things that I missed. Um, Harbender says, when should I expect equity? Are those for more senior roles? No, I've seen I've seen equity given to entry level roles. Um, it will depend a lot on the company though. Your company is a pretty big company though. I'm I'd be surprised if they didn't have some kind of well. In your case, your company's public, so they're not going to have stock options. They may have reserve stock units, or they may have some sort of shareholder plan that you can get a discount, where they might say like whatever the closing cost is the previous day, you get like ten percent discount. Uh, or something like that. Now, keep in mind, if you buy those shares, the, because you're buying public shares, if you're buying them at a discounted price, the IRS is going to say, hey, you just made a 10% profit on that because you bought it at a lower price than the actual value determined by the public market. And so you may have to pay tax on that immediately. Even if you hold on to the shares for a while, you may get subjected to alternative minimum tax or AMT in the United States. So you'll need to ask some really good questions to your HR team about whether you, whether or when you're eligible to participate. Um, and and it, it does vary a little bit on whether the company is private or public. Um, if they're private, a lot more tech companies are doing equity and it's usually what we call incentive stock options. Um, and so again, how many you get, the, like we call it the grant, how many are you granted? Um, and you're never obligated to buy stock options. It's always an option. It's not an obligation. It's not an incentive stock obligation. It's an incentive stock option. Um, and so you should never feel obligated or pressured into buying them. The um, there, there are a lot of tax implications. So um, if you have specific questions about buying stock options, what that whole process has been like, maybe I could do a whole stream on that. That's a big, like, big, big thing to get into. I've actually done a lot of talks with, uh, with boot camps and stuff and explaining, like, if you get an offer and that offer has equity, here's what to expect. Um, and so there's a lot that, uh, that you can take into account, uh, with equity and things like that. If they are a public company though, like Heartbender, um, they may either have what we call reserve stock units or RSUs or reserve share, reserve stock units, RSUs. Um, or they may have like a shareholder discount plan where you can buy shares at any point. In Heartbender's case, that company has been public a long time. I'm, I'm not going to say who it is. They've been public a really long time. And so it's, they're probably more on the, on the uh, stock discount plan or stock discount kind of idea as opposed to giving RSUs. 
But uh, no, equity should not just be reserved for senior level devs. It should be available to everybody uh, within a company. Uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Lego Logic, good to see you in chat here. Um, Lego Logic says I was sent over by Midnight Simon. Good to see you. Thanks for uh, thanks for dropping by. Um, had a question. Let me go find it here. Um, so Lego Logic asked a question in chat. Do you put a skill that you're not profit? Sorry, I just want to reread this. Uh, do you put a skill on your resume that you're not proficient with, assuming that you're familiar or exposed to it? Probably not. If you put something on the resume, so to me, the resume is, here's a list of things that show my value when I come to your company. So a resume doesn't necessarily have to be every skill you've ever acquired, every project you've ever done, every job you've ever had. Your resume really should be a page or two. Um, but the resume also needs to be just a condensed version of here's how I bring value to your company. It should not be here's everything I've ever done ever. Now, if you need to fill up the space because this is all I've done ever, uh, then that can be okay. But remember that you may have had previous jobs, previous experiences, uh, other education that you could be listing on the resume that's not necessarily technical that also brings value to that company. And so learning how to promote that value to them is an important skill and that's what's going to get you noticed when you're sending in that resume to apply for a job so should you put skills on there that you're you only kind of know i wouldn't um, because you're basically saying i'm bringing value to the company because i know this technology in your case if you don't really know that technology then you're not really bringing that as value so for me i would say no now that's where the caveat that a lot of people coming out of like boot camps or fresh out of school, they're like, well, I don't really know anything that well. So do I provide value of any kind? Yeah, you still provide value. So don't feel that by me saying that means that, you know, you can't put anything on your resume unless you've got like a huge amount of experience. That's not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is, you know, if I did like a, you know, like I was studying React recently, if I go build a to-do app in React, it's like, okay, I built one little project in React. And it was a tutorial that I followed step by step. It's not like I had to go figure this out. Someone else showed me step by step what to go build. So that doesn't really count as me knowing React. Me knowing React would be like, I thought of a problem and I built a site for this problem that I wanted to solve. And here's how I figured out what to do in React. That's to me as a hiring manager, that is React experience. Following a tutorial where you're shown step by step what to go build doesn't really to me count as experience um, because you're you're just following steps that you could just be copying and pasting um, and so to me that doesn't really feel like actual experience with something so if you've got what you say in chat is kind of exposure to it i would not consider that as a marketable skill it's something where you can still show like hey i'm able to go learn other languages other frameworks other testing tools other libraries i've consumed other apis in smaller projects, but I, I'm putting it on the resume or I'm talking about it in the interview to show that I'm bringing value to your company as someone who can go learn something and apply that knowledge. That's a little bit different than saying I am a, you know, I know Python because you did it for an afternoon or I, you know, in my case, I know React because I built a to-do list, you know, kind of thing. So I think you have to be careful how you represent yourself with that. I do see a lot of over-representation on resumes where you're claiming more knowledge and more experience on a thing than you really have. And it's a very common thing. And so when we end up seeing those kinds of resumes, you know, if, if I, so just like, I, I don't know your background. So I'm just using as an example, let's say you put Python on there, but you don't really know Python. And I get you on the phone and I say, hey, explain to me what you know about Python. You're like, oh, I wrote this one little script one time. It's like, okay, well, then you don't really know Python. You just threw your whole resume into suspicion on like, what else do you have on this page that you say you know, but you don't really know? You just made a lot more work for me where I've got to go ask a whole lot more questions now about what you actually know. And I'm a lot less likely to move on in the interview process with you. So that's why I think you need to be a little bit careful about how you represent your skills on a resume where the resume is showing this is the value that I bring. Um, and, and also for people that are new in the industry, I also say you need to take care about how many things that you're learning. Um, you don't want to learn a lot of things at the expense of how well you know something. So it's something I call breadth versus depth. 
I would recommend earlier in your career, you want to go really deep on things. You want to learn something really deep and you want to focus a little bit less on the breadth of knowledge. Like I want to go learn this. I want to go learn this. I want this language and that language and this framework and that framework and that framework and that framework and that framework. And, that framework and you know, I often joke, it's like, oh, I've been streaming for an hour and a half, three new JavaScript, you know, frameworks were released in that time. Um, you don't have to go learn all the things. You don't have to know all the things. You don't have to go work with five different databases. Go work with one database. Learn that database really well. Go work in one, maybe two languages. Learn them really well. Go apply for a job. Because the, the depth of that knowledge is going to allow you to transfer that knowledge to other things. But if you have a very shallow amount of knowledge in a lot of things, there's not a lot of knowledge that you can transfer from one skill to the next. Um, just want to follow up in, uh, in chat with some of the other stuff that you're asking as follow up here. Um, so you mentioned, have I used it in a previous job? I'm not sure, I'm not sure to what you were referring. Were you asking about like Python or React? I haven't used React professionally on the job. No. Um, and so I wouldn't put me personally, I wouldn't put React on a resume. If I'm having conversation with somebody, I would say like, oh, you know, on the side, I'm learning React. I don't aspire to be a React developer, but I know that it's an important tool in the industry. And I wanted to learn it just enough to understand like what's a component. Like when people are talking about React components, what does that even mean? How do you build a component? What's in a component? Like I wanted to learn how that mechanism actually worked and operated and how they kind of plug in and how you can combine components to build a whole site. That was the only reason I wanted to learn React. I have no aspiration whatsoever of being a front-end developer. That's just me. But I wanted to learn enough about it that I wasn't completely ignorant that if I hear somebody talk about React, I'm like, nah, they're saying that React word. I'm just going to like cover my ears and not listen. I want to at least have some understanding of what they're talking about. Um, so for me, that's the only reason that I wanted to learn React. But no, I haven't used it on the job and I don't anticipate using it on the job. Um, that said, I never really aspired to be a JavaScript developer and a lot of coding that I'm doing for work is JavaScript, uh, which is fine. I get to go really deep on JavaScript. I'm really proficient in a lot of other languages. And now I get to kind of draw from all of those experiences as I'm learning JavaScript. And so it makes learning JavaScript a little faster um, than if I didn't know, you know, if I only knew one other language, it would make learning a second language a little bit harder. The more languages you learn, the faster you're going to pick up other ones. Um, and you followed up in chat as well and said, for example, Docker. I know how to start up a Postgres SQL for local development, but not really experienced enough to containerize a web application. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I haven't used Docker very much myself. I tend to rely on other people's Docker images. And so I wouldn't put Docker on my resume. It's like I've tinkered with it. I was asked just like a week or two ago from, from someone that I work with. They're like, how well do you know Docker? I'm like, barely. Like I, like I got a guy that I call. <laughs> I got a buddy of mine that's like huge into Docker, huge into Kubernetes. I'm like, if I got a Docker question, that that person's the on, on my speed dial, you know, under listed under Docker. They're like, Dr. Docker, <laughs> I'm going to call that person and, and get them on the phone and find out like what I'm not doing right. Um, or I'm going to go look at a whole bunch of tutorials, but I'm not going to put Docker on my resume. Yeah, it's a buzzwordy keyword and it might get you noticed. But then as soon as you get into that interview, they're going to realize you don't really know it. And that doesn't help you at all in the interview. They're going to start questioning everything about your application at that point, And you're a lot less likely to move forward in the application process. Um, so yeah, I think, I think people need to be a little bit careful about overrepresenting themselves. And again, we do see it a lot on a resume. Um, and, and, you know, once we get you on the phone, that might be why you don't get a second phone call is because they think you've misrepresented something. There could be one reason. I'm not saying that's the only reason you don't get a phone call back, but it could happen. So Dota 2, good to see you in chat. I haven't seen you in a minute. Um, RC Maniac says, I did put expert, proficient, familiar. I got hired on a language that I listed as familiar, but having it there at least gave them a reason to ask. I tend not to put those levels on a resume either. That's just me though, because what does expert mean? Uh, you know, I kind of go back to this whole joke of like, you know, do you put like a 10 star rating of how well you know something because how I might rank you know, four stars out of five or eight stars out of 10 is going to be completely subjective and different than everybody else. So I typically tell people don't put those kinds of progress things on a, on a resume. I would instead say, like, I would put the number of years that you've used something. 
and say, I've done Python for 12 years. I've done MySQL for 18 years. I've done Postgres for seven years. You could put a count of years next to things and that'll give them some idea of like the kinds of things you've probably been involved in. But I like, I wouldn't be putting like proficient or expert on any of that stuff. I'm just gonna be like, hey, I've used Python for a really long time. It's up to you to determine like whether you consider me expert or proficient. That's up to you. I don't wanna level myself. So I'm just gonna tell you how long I've been using that technology and let you decide. Um, but that's me. That's how I put a resume together. This is, but this is also why I love having all of you in chat, sharing your experience and your perspective as well, because don't ever just listen to my opinion. You have to listen to opinions of other people. Um, otherwise you're gonna get very narrow-minded as far as like how to do something. Um, Dota 2 says, it's not a huge step in my mind. Maybe I'm stuck with the curse of knowledge on that one. Maybe. Um, all right. So Epicat asked another question here. So Epic, Epicat uh, followed up in chat. If an applicant had very excellent projects, do you think that would solidify the confidence in that candidate, candidate knowing the technology used in that project? Like solidify confidence enough to not ask as many questions? No, I don't think you're going to, I don't think it's going to get to the point where they're going to be like, oh, look at all these projects. We're not going to ask you anything at all about that technology. Um, I don't think, I don't know that you could ever get to that level unless you've worked on like really major mainstream kinds of projects. I don't think it's ever going to completely alleviate asking you questions about a particular technology. I don't think it, it would get to that point unless you were clearly an industry expert. Like if I was the industry expert at writing chatbots, then they would look at that and go, yeah, we know you can write chatbots. You've written millions of them and it's used all around the world and you're constantly contributing, you know, blah, blah, blah. And clearly you know how to write a chatbot. We don't have to ask you how to build a chatbot. But if you're relatively new in the industry or even with several years of experience, um, I don't know that you would ever be able to build up just a, a quantity of side projects where they're like, yeah, okay, you've done it enough. We're not going to ask you any questions about it. I say this a lot on the stream. Our interview process is one where we have to demonstrate on a regular basis that we can do the job in order to get the job. And so I would say you're probably going to have to show them some amount of skill um, and, and proficiency in a thing. I don't think you would ever completely escape getting getting asked questions or you know being asked fewer questions. Um, I think you know if you say you know Ruby or JavaScript, they're going to be like, great, we got this technical challenge we want you to do in Ruby or JavaScript. You know, that's going to be their expectation from there. Excuse me a sec, I'm going to mute my mic. All right. Um, let's go back through chat here. Senior dev. You can learn languages and frameworks, but you need to know concepts. Yeah. And it's, and it's the same thing when it comes to like algorithmic thinking on tech challenges, like don't go memorize the syntax for a particular problem. You have to understand how to solve that kind of problem. Um, otherwise it's not going to help you. <laughs> Lego logic says, thanks. I'm admitting Docker on my resume. Uh, Dockerized Postgres. Yeah. Again, it, it really depends a lot on, um, on what your level of experience is and how well you can convey the experience that you bring about a thing. All right, going on to another question from RC for Prez. Again, good to have you in chat. Thanks for dropping by. In your opinion, what's the best way for a new developer to balance representation with landing a position? Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about what your thinking is around the idea of representation. If you're thinking about diversity in tech, as far as representation goes or something else. Um, I've also seen that the, the idea of that representation be like, I've got a military background. Do I promote that on my resume? Because some companies are more likely to hire you if you have a military background. Um, you know, that sort of thing. So representation can mean a lot of things, both from a demographic point of view, as well as like a background work experience kind of point of view. So if you can share with me just a little bit more in chat about kind of what your thinking is there around representation, I'm happy to give my thoughts. Again, just my own thoughts. I'm a white guy in tech. 
I've worked around a lot of diversity and I highly promote diversity in tech, but if that's not what you're asking, I don't want to give a bad answer. So if you can give me a little more information um, and you follow up in chat saying representation of skill. Okay, awesome. Thanks for clarifying that. So going back to your question then with that context, what's the best way for a new developer to balance the representation of your knowledge level of a technology and landing a position? I think with with the whole application process in the tech industry the whole application process is really how are you providing value to me and my company like what is it about you that's going to make me want to hire you you should really think about every question i ask you is like i'm asking that question then imagine dot 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 and why should i hire you so tell me about yourself dot 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 and why should i hire you Tell me about your programming skills, dot, 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 and why I should hire you. And, and so every question that you're answering is really framed around the idea of how are you showing them the value that you bring? So as far as like trying to balance the idea of how much you know something and trying to get that job, I think they're really one and the same. Like you have to show them what you know about a particular skill. You have to show them what you're capable of doing. That is the value that you're bringing to their company. And so I think, I think it's really the same thing. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it is the thing that's going to get you that job is showing them that value. A lot of people don't like to talk about themselves. And that's also why sometimes those people don't move forward as quickly in interview processes as people who are willing to say, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. Not an arrogant kind of braggy sort of way where people are like, oh, this person's a jerk. I don't want to work with them. They're smart, but I don't want to work with them. You can be proud of what you do without bragging about what you do or what you've done. And I think it's kind of the same way, even as an entry level role, you can still show the value that you bring to a company without kind of going over the top and like sounding really arrogant, like, look at this project I made and it does this and this and look at this project I made. It does that. You don't have to come across with that sort of uh, tone of voice and, and attitude about it, but you can say, yeah, these are the kinds of projects that I've built because I know that these are the kinds of things that your company is going to care about. Um, and so I often tell people the kinds of projects that you build should be really geared towards the companies that you're researching and what they do. If they've got an API or a product or a library or SDK, anything like that, that you can incorporate into a project, start building that stuff into projects like the sooner the better. Um, as early as you can start building those kinds of things into your project because it changes your introduction to the company of hi I'm a user of yours I want to come work there as opposed to just hi I'm Dota 2 and I happen to have these technical skills that you're looking for I think it can really change that introduction but it also shows the value that you bring hey I've been able to integrate your software I've been able to integrate your API I've been able to read through the documentation learn this stuff enough that I was able to build it into a project that does ABC or I like your company so much and kind of the industry that you're in that I built a project very similar around kind of what you do, or this is how I envision, you know, such and such. Um, and I, I'm thinking of some students that I taught in the past that had a real flair for environmentalism. And so they built out this whole project about, we want to go build like little Raspberry Pi things that can test like soil moisture and uh, look for you know the amount of sun that plants are getting and make sure that we're watering things appropriately or that there's the right amount of shade for certain kinds of plants and they built that up as a project and several of them were promoting that as you know they wanted to go work for companies that care about the environment and they're like here's a project that i build that shows you how much i care about caring for the environment and so it shows that you've got kind of that alignment not to be super buzzwordy and use that alignment word but you have to show the value that you bring and so by building the projects that those companies care about you're going to stand out a lot more than if you're just like hi i built these 15 to-do list applications or you know you built like the same magic eight ball that everybody else writes or you built the same kind of like Oh, I built an app for my friends to go figure out where we're all going to go eat lunch. And we all go in and pick and it randomly picks one of those. It's like, yeah, I've seen like 50 of those projects last week. Like, show me something new. Show me something novel. Like, think of a real world problem. Like some people think of like, well, that is a real world problem. It's like, okay, but put a different spin on it or something. Like, don't just go out to the Yelp API and do the same Yelp API lookup that everybody else is doing. <coughs> go find something new and novel about it. Go figure out where everybody lives 
go find the average latitude and longitude and now look for a restaurant in that area so everybody's got to travel approximately the same distance to get there as opposed to you know everybody lives here in denver so just go find a restaurant in denver and i've got to drive an hour to get there and someone else like walks across the block to get there like think of something novel about that kind of approach that's going to stand out and then if it's a company that deals with geolocation, you can be like, hey, I built out this project. Yeah, it's another lunch picker, magic eight ball kind of thing, but I really like geolocation. So I specifically built geolocation into this project so we can kind of get an average of where everybody lives. So it's not just another restaurant picker app. It's also based on location. So everybody travels the same amount of distance to get there or approximately the same amount of time. Um, depending on how many friends are, are, there are and, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's, there's stuff to take into account there. But it, it shows a different spin on that project than just doing the same old thing that everybody else does. That's how you're going to stand out. Show the value to the company. Show them something novel and really unique that when they look at that project, they're like, huh, that's how you get their attention. That's how, you know, even if the recruiter doesn't really catch it, you can kind of get them on the phone and say, like, I'd love to talk to the hiring manager about this geolocation thing I built. They're like, okay. And they'll give you to the hiring manager. And if you can make that hiring manager go, huh, you got a much better chance of moving ahead on that stuff. So a couple of ideas there. Uh, I know I'm really behind on, uh, on chat. But yeah, Dota 2, good to see you in chat. Um example saying you know 10 languages versus i have a year of general programming in a variety of languages yeah um so the bang dad joke is just bang joke now uh so you can just do bang joke and it'll give you a dad joke uh, Zoe, good to see you in chat too um Cars Lark, good to see you as well um rc Manic says i'll also state that whenever i got the technical challenge i always ask is there a language you want me to do this in because it puts the whole, if you question me on putting a familiar programming language on my resume, ask me to do an interview question in it, I will. It does show that, yeah, if I say I know Python and you tell me you want me to do this in Python, then obviously I can demonstrate that I, I know Python. Um, I usually tell people though, just use whatever language you are most proficient in. Um, I have seen people who get take-home challenges and they say like we want you to build it in xyz technology and they don't know that technology i would uh, a piece of advice that i heard so this isn't something i came up with the piece of advice i heard is you can ask them how do you want me to go with this do you want me to write it in this technology and show you what i'm capable of learning or do you want me to use this technology that i know really well and i can show you what i'm capable of as far as like really building this out like really amazing so if you want me to use JavaScript and React, be aware, I'm not really familiar with it. I'll figure it out, but I'm probably not gonna finish, but I'm gonna show you my learning process as I go versus I know Python and fast API. And I can go build this thing way more and do like full test-driven development and blah, 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 and Dockerize it and all this stuff. Which way do you want me to go? And put the choice back on them and, and let them choose. Do you want them to see what you're capable of learning and documenting that learning process if they really want to hold you to using that technology or do they want to see what you're capable of in something that you do know really well put the choice back on them you don't necessarily have to do it in the technology they tell you to but if you're going for a like say a java job at some point you're gonna to have to demonstrate that you either know java or can learn java in order to get that job if you don't know it at all um, and so by saying like, Hey, I don't know Java. So if you want me to do this take home assignment in Java, I'm going to show you what I'm capable of. It's going to take me a little bit longer, or I may not finish completely by this deadline that you've given me, but I can show you what I'm capable of doing. I think that that's a better position to show them than to struggle through and like give them something that's sort of half baked. Um, that's not like fully finished and, and fully flushed out. That would be my take on that. RC for Prez also asked in chat, can you share your thoughts? Oh, oh, can I share my thoughts on representation in terms of diversity as well? Yeah, so kind of going back to the idea that I had around, um, you know, with diversity of either demographic data or diversity of background experience, you're bringing a lot more value to the company based on your overall life experience than just the technical skill that you bring. You will have dealt with different kinds of people, different kinds of scenarios, situations. You may have had 
um, access to working with customers or not. Um, you know, depending on the kinds of jobs that you've had or just life experiences that you've been able to have and showing them that that also adds to your value as an employee, that you are kind of like a well-rounded sort of person overall, that you are more than just an accumulation of technical skill. Yes, that is primarily what they're hiring you for, but being able to show them the value of what else you bring. And it's not just like, oh, I'm a token, you know, fill in the blank kind of hire, you know, for your diversity and equity inclusion stats, but showing them like, no, I'm bringing actual value to your company because I've got this background and that background and I've worked these kinds of jobs and I'm bringing all of that experience in who I am. And that's what I'm bringing to the job every day. Um, and you know, again, like going back to the idea of military background, like I, I, I often tell people like promote your military background. You don't have to hide that on a resume. Some people are like, well, I don't want to bring it up. Some people feel uneasy about war and stuff like that. I'm like, I get it, but it also shows leadership and discipline and, and, you know, all of the things that come with that. Like, you don't have to say like, oh, I, you know, I was in Afghanistan for three years and I, you know, was in this many combat fights or whatever like you don't have to quantify that kind of stuff but you can say yeah i was in the military and i was deployed overseas just leave it at that and let them make an assessment on like whether they want to go into that at the very least thank you for your service right they're going to thank you for that and say cool you're bringing that other discipline you know maybe you used your gi bill to go back to school and learn these technical skills and so again you get to tell a little bit more of that story about how you got into tech same thing with diversity if you come from what we call misrep like underrepresented groups, um, not misrepresented. That was a that was a bad choice of words on my part. But I think of like white people as being overrepresented, and so if you are part of a group which is not already overrepresented in tech, then you can also bring that experience to them as well and say, "This is my background. This is how it's helped me in tech. This is how I got into tech and some of the challenges I've had to overcome." And it shows them that you are also a problem solver and. You know, that you've got this real world tangible experience that you're bringing to the job besides just being a JavaScript developer or a C Sharp developer or whatever. You're bringing a whole lot more to their company than just the hard technical skills, if that makes sense. So that would be my thoughts around that whole idea of representation. Like, it, is it something that you have to actively promote on the resume? You don't have to. I think that there are ways that you can do it in, in a more subtle way if you choose to but it's also part of you and your personality like be you if if part of who you are is standing up for being you know not part of an overrepresented group in tech then promote that talk about it be very upfront about you know uh, I'm part of this or that kind of community, and this is how I've been able to build up that community around me. I've been part of this or that program, which has helped other people from the same sort of background that I've had also get into tech, um, you know, or, or even, you know, you don't, you don't even have to have had like a leadership kind of role. You can just say, I've been part of a community where we build each other up. You know, that kind of thing. Like you can still promote that in a way that says that's important to me. That's part of who I am. That's part of what I'm bringing to the company every day. This is the value that I bring. This, like I make people feel included. I can kind of lift people up around me. Uh, what's that saying? Like a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. I use that with a, with a chat with my manager this week too. Um, you can talk about how you work in that uh, sort of space of community building around how you want to build up other people around you. Um, that's a value that you bring. So you don't have to be like super blatant about it. But again, if that's part of your personality and that's part of your sort of personal brand and who you are, you don't have to dial that back. That's who you are. That's that's who they're going to be hiring. And if they have a problem with it, it's on them. It's not on you. So be you. Be who you are. Be your genuine self. Bring your genuine, authentic self to that interview and that phone call and that meeting. Be you period and and bring it bring it to them show them what you're capable of and and let them make the decision from there kind of going back through chat here i heard an anecdote that may or may not be true bill gates was in saudi arabia 
split down the middle with a curtain, men on one side, women on the other, he was asked, how can we compete with the likes of U.S. tech industry? And Gates responded, remove the barriers between your people and embrace everyone. Yeah, I don't know whether that's true. I haven't heard that story myself. Don't restrict who you accept so you can get the most ideas and capability. There's there's very much, like there are so many stories, not just in the tech industry. There, there are tons of stories just in manufacturing and the world at large about people who didn't take other people's positions into account. And it caused physical harm, like serious physical harm, even death in some cases. Um, and I think all the way back to like the 70s when they were developing airbags, they were completely baffled and absolutely confused why women and children were being mangled and killed by airbags. They were being designed to save people. Well, the only people they were saving were the 200 pound, six foot tall men that were designing them. Nobody thought like, hey, maybe some smaller people are going to be in the car. Maybe lighter people are going to be in the car. Maybe we should consider that as we're developing these things. And this is why now we've got like full like cabin canopies of airbags because they were so secluded in who was designing these things that they weren't taking other people into account. These things happen all the time. And they happen also to major tech companies when Apple released their first iPhone or, or uh, they released the iPhone and they were coming up with all these different apps. They had a health monitoring app. And the one thing they didn't have in their health monitoring app was for women to track their menstrual period. It's like, really, you didn't have one woman on the team. You didn't have a guy maybe married to a woman anywhere on the team. Like there were no women involved whatsoever in the planning, the design, the production, the testing, like any aspect of this software development all the way to releasing it to production. You didn't have one woman in any of that say, hey, this is something we track on a regular basis, right? You go into the app store now, either Google or Apple, and you go look for like period tracker apps. There's tons of them. There's tons of them because people realize these major companies have these blinders on where the people in the room, they end up as this echo chamber because they all look the same. They all think the same. They are all the same and they don't think differently. And there's a difference between saying, I made this and you can use it versus I made this with you in mind. And that's kind of the whole attitude I take about this whole channel, this whole streaming thing that I do. I don't just say like, you're welcome to come hang out on the live stream. I reach out to people from all these different communities saying, I'm building this community with you in mind. I'm building this for people that want to get that first job in tech. You're the people that I want to come here and ask questions so I can share my perspectives and my ideas and build up other people within the community that can go out and get jobs and now come back and give their ideas and perspectives on what worked for them. And it's not necessarily like, you know, I want to have Zooey on the, on the stream, certainly, but I don't want it to just be like, oh yeah, I followed Ian's advice and I got a job. That's not my, that's not my hope for that call when I get Zooey on the call. I want Zooey to come in and share the struggle, share the pain, share the hard times, share the low points and, and all the different kinds of things that Zooey had to do to go get that job. That's what I want for that stream. So other people that I have on the stream, I want to hear their journeys and their perspectives because it's going to be very different from my own. I've had privilege in my own life because I'm a white guy in tech. I understand that. But I want to use this platform to kind of raise that awareness and build the community. And I'm building this community specifically with those people in mind. People that are coming from a, from a diverse background who are not white men in tech, who, who are, you know, struggling and want help. That's what this community is for. That's who I'm building this for. So it's more than just, you are welcome to be here. I am building this for you with you in mind. And a lot of people that build these apps don't have that same mindset. They're like, here's something cool that I think we should build. And they get other people that look like them, sound like them, want to work on the project like them. And they build the thing and they completely exclude whole swaths of people because the people building the app are not those people and they don't ask for their input. And so they put the thing out and then they get backlash or they go, you know, why didn't you build it this way? Why didn't you build it that way? Because they're not taking other voices into concern. I know it sounds very soapboxy of me, but it's something that I'm very passionate about. And that's why I've, I've got this whole notion for 2022 that any subscriptions, bits, donations, any money that I get for doing resume reviews, 
It's all going to organizations that are helping raise diversity in tech. That's my whole purpose for this channel is to get people jobs in tech, specifically people who are diverse, because that's where my heart is. Those are the people that I care about that I want to see get into the tech industry. That's my whole reason for being here. So I appreciate everybody coming by and listening to me rant and rave on that from time to time, but it's something that I genuinely care about. Um, and so I know it's, it's kind of a roundabout way. And I, I know I got a little maybe political about my answer. Um, but when I think about people who are being excluded, those are the kinds of things that come to mind that you can end up with this echo chamber where everybody looks the same, acts the same, thinks the same. And then it just becomes an echo chamber of bouncing those same ideas off one another. And that's why diversity in tech is important because we need those other experiences. And so part of explaining who you are and the value you bring to the company is more than just the hard technical skill that you bring. You need to show them how you think differently. You need to show them that yes, you, you can build the same kinds of ideas that they have. You can build the same sorts of projects that they want you to build, but do it from a different mindset. That's why they should be hiring you. Not just because you're, like I say, that token DEI kind of hire. If they're doing it for that reason, they're doing it for a very, very wrong reason. But by you sharing that value with them, you're providing them an opportunity to say, yes, you are bringing far more value to our company than just those technical skills. So yeah, talk about it. Be you, be your genuine, authentic self and explain to them why you got into tech, how it's impacted your life, why it's an important aspect of who you are and what you do. Um, talk about all of that. Talk about the communities that you're in, how you're building other people up. Talk about it. That's the only way that they're going to kind of get that message. Uh, UO Moon says same thing with medical stuff being poorly designed for black people. Yep, I agree. Um, and, and even going to things like computer vision and, and like hand dryers, like hand dryers don't recognize darker skin. It's like, why not? Who built those sensors that it doesn't detect darker skin? You know, Google's been making fantastic moves this year with their Android cameras to detect darker skin and like coming out with actual real skin tones and being able to detect, you know, darker complexions. Why did it take Google that long? Like why? Why did it take a decade of Android phones for them to get to that point? More than a decade. They've been building out Android phones since 2009. I think the first Android phone came out in 2009. I remember having a Nexus one in 2010 and there was one before that. That was the first Android phone. They've had these Android phones out for that long. They've had camera phones out for that long. And it's only been in 2021, 2022 that, you know, suddenly this miraculous, you know, way of detecting skin tone is a thing. It's like, why wasn't it a thing a decade ago? <laughs> Those people were still around a decade ago. Like, why weren't you building it for them a decade ago? Yeah, anyway. Um, Karslak says, I was able to figure out my university situation. Awesome. So I'll be attending UMN Twin Cities for a bachelor's in computer science. Good for you. That's awesome. Thanks for your advice the past few weeks. Still working on my portfolio. It's helping a lot. That's fantastic. I love hearing that. Good job. Good for you. Um, Mercy Manic says it's not right. Give people an opportunity, they'll fill the space given to them. Yeah, exactly. And and beyond, beyond. You give them the room and the opportunity to grow and they will surprise you in ways that you won't anticipate. Um, so yeah, just hire people. It doesn't matter where they live. It doesn't matter what their background is, what their demographics are. If they can demonstrate they can do the job, they should get the job. And they should get the same pay for that job, no matter who they are or where they are. Um, yeah, those are all things that are like super important to me. So if you follow me on Twitter, he's the same username on Twitter, you will see me rant and rave about this from time to time. Good times, good times. I appreciate everybody's thoughts and, and stuff in chat. We've been going for two hours now. I think I'm going to start to wrap up. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everybody's thoughts for sure. Very, very much appreciate everybody's thoughts and opinions and helping each other out in chat. As always, I really appreciate everybody sharing their ideas and so on. Uh, DC Sublime, good to see you. Uh, DC Sublime is also part of uh, Loyal Moses's uh, uh, community. 
Uh, so yeah, good to see you as well. I'll give you a little blinky light for dropping by. Hello. Um, so yeah, so again, I'm going to be streaming on Saturday. So all the, all the notes here underneath, uh, loyal Moses and his community, they're going to be hosting like a stream of streamers on Saturday. So I'm going to be streaming for a little while on Saturday and, um, just to build up like a handful of viewers. And then we're going to go right into that channel. Not that I want to win that swag cause I've already got a stream deck and I've already got lights. Uh, but I want to do it just to bring other people and just find some other interesting streams online. Uh, appreciate the bits. Thank you so much. Heartbender. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so come hang out on Saturday. I will stream a little bit on Saturday. Uh, probably do a little bit of code. I might show a little bit of the, uh, the chat bot that I've got going, um, and some of the stuff that you can do. Zui, good to see you as well. Um, so yeah, so we've got, uh, channel point redemptions now for the nano leaf. So we can do things like, um, what's one of the other ones? Nemo, I think is my orange and white one. Um, so you can now redeem channel points to control the lights behind me. Um, I'm still working out a way for subscribers to actually own a panel. Uh, for the time being, I'm just going to 3D print a logo that you care about and like put that over the, the panel. Uh, so Juggling Biohazards was the first one. Uh, they, they gifted some, uh, some gift subs the other day, which is fantastic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to print a, a little figurine juggling the biohazard symbols. Uh, you won't be able to see it very well because the panels are kind of far away, but you'll be able to see that somebody's juggling something. Uh, you just won't be able to make out that it's uh, the little biohazard symbols. Um, but, uh, yeah. So if you are a subscriber, I'm going to go through and like find all my subscribers and I'll reach out to you and see like, which of these panels do you want and what do you, what would you like to have represented on there? And as long as it's like community friendly and family friendly, um, I will 3d print something for you and hang it on your panel for you. Uh, what, uh, to blink the nano leafs, uh, there is a channel point redemption for that as well. I've got it kind of expensive right now cause I don't want to burn the nano leaf panels out by redeeming those things over and over and over and over. Uh, so it will cost you 5,000 channel points. Bit, bits well spent, uh, but it will make it blink. It's basically going to make it do this without the applause. Um, but, uh, but it'll basically just make them blink like that. Um, any idea when the next resume review is going to be? Uh, I need to get some resumes to review. So if you would like a resume review, um, what is that command? Is it resume or resume review? I think I actually had to spell it all out, resume review. Um because stream elements is still listening to my channel. If you do resume, it thinks I'm trying to resume playback of the music as opposed to actually doing a resume. So, um, so yeah, the blink will actually just make them flicker like that for a second. Um, but yeah, if you would like a resume review, um, here's the link in chat right here, here, going to learn how to point again. Um, so yeah, you can submit a resume to me. I do ask that you anonymize like your name, your email, your phone number. Um, and if you want to anonymize companies and, and things like that, you're welcome to. Um, and I'll give you a free resume review on the stream. If you would like a private resume review, you can find details on that same page. I do charge money for that, but 100% of that money is going into the same pot that I'm giving away. So know that you're not putting that $50 into my pocket. You're putting it temporarily <laughs> through PayPal into my pocket temporarily to then give away to other people. Uh, so I'm not keeping any of that money. Um, so please just be aware of that. Um, and I appreciate everybody's efforts to help just raise some amount of funds and we're going to find communities and, and groups that we can give that money to this year. Um, and so, yeah, tell people to drop by. Ultimately, I just want to build up the community. Like I give away all this information for free and all this knowledge for free. Um, I don't ask for any money or anything in return for it other than tell friends, have them come subscribe to the YouTube channel uh youtube channel and you can also follow me on linkedin i use the same username on twitter and linkedin you can connect with me there i'm happy to answer questions anonymously on twitter or linkedin um, or if you ever see the id 736 bot this guy right here in chat you can send a whisper over to that chat bot and it'll pop up as an anonymous question in chat as well i want people to feel safe about coming and asking for help um, and then eventually, like I said, I want the bot to send that stuff over to the discord community. Uh, so you can, you can do uh, exclamation point discord. If you want to see, uh, the discord community and you're welcome to join us over there. And, uh, you can DM me questions on discord. You can DM me on LinkedIn. You can DM me on Twitter. Happy to take questions at any time. You can send me a whisper on Twitch. I don't always see those right away. Um, but if you send me a whisper DM, whatever, I will answer your question, but I may also bring your question back to the stream at some point and say, Hey, I had a question come in. This is what it was about. And this is how I answered it just to help other people out. Because if you've got that question, somebody else probably has that question too. And I don't mind answering the same questions over and over. I would rather people ask the question and make it feel repetitive in my answer 
but I also learn things over time too. And I also shift my perspective and, and things based on things that I learn and books that I read um, and things that I stay up to date on. And I'm happy to share that knowledge back again. So please, please drop questions to me at any time. I'm happy to uh, take those questions. Arpender says, thanks so much for what you do for the community. Super great stream. Can't wait to see the future. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate that very much. Um, go give Heartbender a follow. Heartbender is pretty entertaining to uh, to go watch. If uh, if you're into the Dead for is it Dead by Daylight or Dead for Daylight or something like that, um, I'm not really into that kind of game, but it's entertaining to watch Heartbender play. And uh, if, if it's it's a it's a bit of a scary game, so if you're into like scary horror games, then maybe don't follow Heartbender. But it is pretty fun to watch for sure. Uh, Dead by Daylight, thanks. Um, I like having it just on in the background uh, while I'm working on this other stuff like my bot. Um, and so I'll go over my bot a little bit on Saturday, I think, as, as I kind of kick off that stream. And then we're going to go over to Loyal Moses' uh, stream uh, just to kind of introduce everybody to everybody. I'll probably like be on a call, you know, briefly and introduce, you know, what I stream about and, and so on. Um, and so if you want to drop by on Saturday, that would be fantastic. I do believe that viewers that raid in are also going to be entered in some kind of draw so he might be doing some draws throughout the day for different kinds of things um, i've told them already that i want to sponsor a couple of t-shirts for a t-shirt giveaway um, and so there is going to be some stuff to give away to the viewers not just the streamers that stream in the streamers that stream in have the opportunity to win a stream deck xl as well as the elgato key light um, but for the viewers i as i recall as i was told recently they're also going to have something that they can enter a drawing for as well so come hang out with us on saturday we're going to raid over that channel um, so watch out for that you will need to follow to get that notification of when i go live um, so if you don't follow me please follow me if you're watching this on youtube later on please like and subscribe come follow me on twitch too and uh, come hang out on saturday as well if you can otherwise i'll be streaming sunday morning at 10 a.m pacific 1 p.m eastern gotta make sure i get those time zones right i always get them mixed up um, so yeah, come back and hang out on Sunday. As soon as I get, you know, one or two resumes in, uh, I will do that resume review. Um, the more that I get, the more we can do the resume reviews. I kind of wanted to do like, oh, the first Thursday of the month will be like resume review, but, um, they kind of come in sporadically. Sometimes I'll get like two or three at a time. Sometimes I'll go a couple of weeks and not get any. Um, and so I think, I think for the time being, I'll just do them as they come in. Um, and if I get more than two or three, I'll probably just spread them out over a couple of streams. And then my goal is that when I put these videos up on YouTube, that I'm going to clip out just that resume review and continue to add those to the playlist for other resume reviews. So there's a whole playlist over here on my YouTube channel that you can go check out if you are curious about just general resume advice. Um, some of it will feel a little repetitive because I do kind of share the same kinds of thoughts uh, over time. But I also do shift kind of what I think and believe and, and guests that I have on the stream, I'll have them do a resume review. And it's always interesting to hear how other people think a resume should be built. So come continue to hang out with us, please. Uh, let's build up this community and help people out. Um, if you've got thoughts and ideas that you want to share, please DM me as well. I'm always happy to have people on the stream as well. We'll get you on a call and we'll do like a little side by side and we'll have a, some conversation and hear about your background. Uh, we're going to arrange at some point to have uh, Zooey on here as well and kind of hear their their journey. Um, but uh, yeah, if you've got thoughts and perspectives that you'd love to share kind of with the overall community, please reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, we'll figure out a way to schedule that and make that happen. Um, I'm going to be missing at least two streams on Thursday night in May. I think the 12th and the 19th. The 12th is my birthday, so I'm, I take that day off. I get off the screens. And then the 19th, uh, I think I'm at a conference that night, so I won't be around on the 19th. And I'm going to a conference and I'm doing a meetup that, that night uh, for work, so I won't be streaming that night. I may stream like some other night just to kind of offset things a little bit, but uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Um, I've also got a channel, Ian the Postmanot. Um, if you search for the word Postmanot, so the word Postman with A-U-T on there, if you just search for that on Twitch, you'll find my other account. Um, I do some live coding on that channel from time to time. Um, the next couple of weeks are going to be fun with workshops and things like that. Um, and so I'll be finding interesting things to code about, uh, whether I'm building out a little API for, for a project ID or something like that. So go give that account a follow as well if you want. Um, let's go find somebody to raid. Who's online? Well, Midnight Simon's online. Freckled Science is online. Freckled Science is always fun to, to go watch. Um, who else? Who else have I been following lately? Let's go. I'm just going to... Uh, click through a couple of folks here and see who else is online 
streaming software related things. Got somebody doing some Elm development with components. Um, <laughs> point out Maker Deck is back up. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so Maker Deck is, is a really interesting stream of just people that are 3D printing. One of these days, I'm going to figure out how to get my 3D printers in another version of OBS that I can like stream up to their thing too. Because I'm going to, oh, that's the other thing I forgot to mention. So down here underneath my name, you're going to see there's a giveaway. Um, people that subscribe to my daily email series, uh, let me shut off the drop game for a moment. Uh, so down here at the very bottom, you'll see a link from my daily email series. You can also do bang email to get more information about it. Um, throughout the month of May, Every stream I do in May, I'm going to be giving away a 3D printed dragon. Let me show you. And I got tons of them. So I've got, I got a whole pile of them on my desk and I'm printing more. Um, and so they are these really cool articulated dragons. I've got bright gold. I've got like a darker gold. I've got a really dark gold that's printing now. I've got kind of this chrome sort of color. They, they come out looking amazing. Um, they're about two feet long. And they're all different colors and things like that. I've got color changing filament. And so every stream in May, I'm going to give one of these away to someone on the channel. And I'm also going to be drawing every stream, one of my subscribers. And so if you subscribe to the daily email series, um, I'm also going to randomly pick someone as a subscriber uh, during those streams. And you're also going to get a dragon. Um, and you can win multiple. And you can, you can choose. Uh, so I've also got a second style of dragon as soon as these ones finish printing i've got a different kind of dragon one that kind of stands up and like rears his head back uh, a little bit if you've seen the imperial dragon model uh, i'm going to be printing those next and you will get to choose if you're on the stream you're going to get to choose the model of the dragon as well as the color of the dragon uh, based on availability and what i have left um, and as they get chosen they will not be available but uh, i'm going to be doing another 3d printing giveaway uh, all the month of may so every stream i do in may i'm going to be giving away some dragons one for people that are present and one for a subscriber to my daily email series. So go give that series a follow. Um, you can do bang email to get information about that. If you've already been a subscriber, then you're already in that drawing. If you subscribed and finished it, you can resubscribe because uh, I'm going to be drawing from that database. So give you a 3D printer. Mm, no. Um, it's crazy how cheap they are nowadays. Yeah, for sure. You can get into 3D printing now for like 150 bucks, 200 bucks. Um, now, that said, Loyal Moses also gives away tons of 3D printing stuff, including printers on his channel. So go follow that channel. Uh, there's lots of stuff being given away over there. Yeah, he gives them away. I think he gave away five this month alone. So the very first Friday, he gave away one. The second Friday on the 15th, he gave away two. The following Friday, he gave away two more. Um, and I think on one of them, he gave away like a laser engraver instead of a 3D printer. So, it, you know, still kind of moves around, but it actually does laser engraving instead of 3D printing. Um, and, and one of the 3D printers was big enough to do like cosplay helmets. So, yeah, go hang out at Loyal Moses's channel. Let me, uh, let me do a shout out for that. I need to rebuild my shout out command. So in the meantime, I'm just going to say twitch.tv Loyal Moses. Um, and yeah, he's got a really cool setup for his stream, definitely. He's got like tons of printers, he's got tons of helmets, and pretty much every stream he does, he's giving something away. He's giving away filament, he's giving away printers, he's giving away helmets, he's giving away something. So go hang out on his channel. And like I said, on Saturday, he's giving away like these, like $500 worth of streamer gear, uh, just because he wants to help community. He, he knows that this stuff is, you know, cost prohibitive, and he wants to help people out. Me, I'm giving away 3D dragons because they're awesome. So come hang out on the channel in May. Uh, tell other folks that they can drop by in May. And uh, yeah, like I said, we'll give one away to someone in chat. And we'll also give one away to uh, one of the subscribers to the email series. So go subscribe to that thing as well. Uh, we'll be doing that every stream through the whole month of May. So Sundays and Thursdays, whenever I stream, I'm going to be giving these uh, these things away. Until they're all gone. So even, that is probably going to mean we're going to go beyond the month of May. It'll probably spill into June, uh, but that's okay. We'll just keep giving them away till they're all given away. How's that? How's that sound? Or if I end up with way too many, maybe I'll give away two or three per stream instead of just two. I'll give like three away or four. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Maybe by the end of May, I'll be so tired of giving them away. I'll just be like, everybody in chat gets a dragon or something. Who knows? We did that back in December. We had like a dozen people in chat and I had a dozen dragons. So everybody got a dragon. I literally boxed them up and shipped them all over the place. So yeah, come hang out again. Um, who are we going to go raid? Did we ever decide who we're going to go raid? 
Uh, there was somebody doing uh, something in Elm. Um, any ASCII? There was somebody from uh, 100 Devs that I've been following lately, but I don't see them streaming right now. But there was somebody from 100 Devs that I was following. Um, this person's doing some Kubernetes. So if you want to get better at Kubernetes and Docker, I think we'll go give them a raid. Um, they got a handful of followers. So yeah, I think we'll go go give them a raid. You missed your stream again. Yeah, you should follow me. Then you get notified when I go live. I stream at the same time every time. Um, just kidding. Things S. Things, things S. Thing SS. Not sure how you want me to pronounce your name, but uh, thanks for dropping by. Yeah, I stream I stream the same time on Thursdays and Sundays. Um, and then for work, I, I kind of stream sporadically, like whenever I'm in the mood or whenever I've got like a little bit of downtime or it's my lunchtime or something like that. Um, yeah, otherwise I stream at 7 p.m. Mountain Time on Thursdays and 11 a.m. Mountain Time on Sundays. So subtract an hour for Pacific Time. So 6 p.m. Pacific on Thursdays and 10 a.m. Pacific on Sundays. Now this Saturday, I'm also gonna be streaming here because of like a, a big giveaway kind of event that's going on. Um, maybe I should do some of these dragons as a giveaway for that Saturday thing. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but yeah, thanks for dropping by. I do appreciate you dropping by either way. Um, let's go learn about some Kubernetes. Let me go set up that raid. So we're going to raid over to someone called any ASCII and, uh, yeah, we'll see everybody over there. So feel free to drop a whole bunch of emotes, make a bunch of noise, give them a follow. Um, it's always fun to go learn something new, some new technology and just find someone else's perspective on that. So we'll see you all over there in a couple of moments. All right, and we'll see you on Saturday and then again on Sunday. Have a good night, folks.